Okay, welcome to the next day of Fuzz Week. Um, I did a couple things off stream. I was just describing them and I wasn't recording. But I added this tracing flag that allows you to enable tracing, which allocates this relatively large buffer. And if this buffer is present, um, or enable tracing is set, then in the JIT, currently not implemented in the emulator, but in the JIT, it will save the entire register state, all 32 registers plus PC, uh, into that vector uh, on every single instruction. So you'll get to see the register state prior to every single instruction getting executed, which is useful for debugging and profiling and tracing and seeing if you can find bugs in the emulator. Um, if it runs out of room, it'll crash. It'll just forcibly crash the program. Uh, since this is a debugging feature, I wasn't going to bother making it all sophisticated and actually plumb up an error code that's like out of room and trace buffer and allow re-entrancy into the JIT. If you're using this feature, it's for debugging. Change this to a larger size if you need more room. It's like, it's for debugging. It's like a hundred or a thousand X slowdown in performance. You would never actually use this in a real environment, even for introspection. So there's just no reason for me to really make this that fancy. I'd rather just keep this uh, very straightforward. Um, and so I added that. The other thing that I added was um, I added this block um, in the MMU in the reset. I added this assertion, which is gated by, it's not even a, a global, which I should make it, uh, or a constant. But effectively, um, this will assert that all of the memory is identical after the reset because we differentially restore. We restore by checking dirty bits. We uh, clear some th things. We do like a weird restore of this so we don't actually end up creating a new allocation. Um, and because of that, I put this in here to assert that everything is identical after all of the differential restores, because it should be. Um, and I actually found there was a bug in that yesterday, because my set permissions um, didn't actually update the dirty bits, which means that you could modify the permissions of memory, and that might not actually get reset in a subsequent fuzz case to the original state of that memory. And now that we have an allocator and we hook the allocator, we are dynamically changing permissions during execution in a way that is not deterministic. It may vary from fuzz case to fuzz case. So adding this was necessary. Um, at this point, I fuzzed 10, 100,000 iterations with this, uh, these assertions in place, and I've never seen it fail. So that means all of the bytes of memory, all the permission bytes, all the active allocations, and the current allocation base all match up after the reset, which is safe to say everything is identical. Um, so I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, I'm not too surprised about that. I think I thought about that or talked about that earlier where we eventually would need to add that when we added an allocator. And then I can kind of forgot when we went back to, went back to add that allocator. Um, so we polished that up. So effectively, I now have a way of tracing. Um, and then I found that the uh, current target I was running, because we made a modification to libc, because libc would go out of bounds by default on certain string operations. Um, and we, obviously that, that's an issue because we have byte level permissions. We catch things that are off by one. And those string routines exploit the alignment of pages and memory permissions and know if one byte is valid, then the remainder of a word is always valid. You can always do a word fetch um, up until like a boundary of a page. Uh, effectively. So since they kind of exploit that feature, it would go out of bounds and we'd get crashes which don't exist. So we went in and we found a flag that basically disabled um, the like high performance versions and went to just a byte by byte basic version. And I ran that and I found after adding the tracing stuff that like 90% of the instructions I spent executing were literally in um, memset, where it was just zeroing out, I think, the BSS at the start of the program, and then there's one other hash table allocation that does the same thing later in execution. Um, obviously, that's a pretty big issue, and I got a, a relatively large speed up from that. I also was doing some comparisons to AFL to see how fast we are. I think we're getting like 300 fuzz cases a second on a single core, and AFL is getting 1,900, uh, which leaves us at about... About six times slower, um, which is not terrible. It's also not fair because object dump is, or because AFL is not using um, 
ASAN, and we are using ASAN. In fact, we have ASAN plus MSAN uh, built into our tooling that we're tracking at all times. Uh, and ASAN, I actually tried to run AFL with ASAN, but apparently it really doesn't like ASAN on 64-bit, and I didn't have a 32-bit toolchain set up, so I wasn't able to uh, build it for 32-bit, which is the common workaround. Uh, also, that's a less apples-to-apples -apples comparison because that's a whole bitness change between the two targets. Um, but effectively, it's safe to say ASAN is typically about a 2x slowdown. So if you factor that in, that drops AFL to about 1950 a second, and that drops us down to about three times slower than AFL on a single core. But we scale linearly with cores, which means we can throw all 192 threads at the problem, and we can't do that in AFL in a way that scales to cores. So, that aside, um, I want to do a couple performance tweaks of the JIT today, and I also want to do more target-specific introspection and profiling. Uh, it's kind of convenient because profiling the target also is kind of the same logic that you use to discover what you're hitting in the target. Um, but mainly, I want to identify what areas of code are slowing us down in the target right now, such that we can figure out either A where we should focus our optimization efforts in our JIT. For example, if we see 90% of our CPU time is happening by like parsing or uh, changing certain things in like a, a mem set or something, we could look at how to make mem set faster in our JIT. There are potentially different ways that we could do that. Um, we could have a mem set intrinsic. We could hook mem sets, and we could perform the mem set ourselves in native code, um, and that would allow us to kind of place in a um, an equivalent without actually interpreting the bytes directly. So there there are a couple ways that we can speed up uh, hot paths, and if we find out that all of the performance is kind of spread over the entire application. We can't really do a focused optimization like that. Um, and at that point, it comes down to how can we trim down the fuzz case? Can we make smaller fuzz inputs or a smaller fuzz corpus that has the same efficacy of the larger one? Uh, a one meg file is going to take a lot longer to parse than a 1K file. So if that 1K file can have the same complexity as the one meg file, we want to do that. So we might write an elf parser today since we are fuzzing objects dump which handles elves might write an elf fuzzer or an elf uh, kind of compressor for example we could figure out what uh, information is being parsed out of the elf and we could basically turn any section that isn't parsed for example the the code uh, the data section is probably not parsed in the default state or um, in the disassembly, it's probably not parsing the data section. So we could potentially delete the data and BSS sections uh, while keeping their headers in there, but we could make them set them to like a one byte size such that all of the metadata and the parsing is the same, but the raw payload, which doesn't actually affect how the tool behaves, could maybe be compressed to one byte or zero bytes or something uh, such that we can still fuzz the headers, but we're not actually dealing with massive copies of the whole file or more seeking and, and reading of the file through syscalls. So those are the things I kind of want to look at today, and those go hand in hand with uh, coverage analysis. They're effectively the same thing. Um, we'll probably end up taking our coverage information and then plotting it in a way that we can view it on source line or see it by function, and then we can see if anything really stands out there. If we see something... That's taking 90% of CPU time. That would be easy to optimize. We can optimize that. Um, if we see that there is like code that's executing that makes no sense for the fuzz case, we can try and snapshot around that and trim that out of the core fuzz loop. Um, so there's a bunch of things that we can kind of play around with there. So that makes sense. Sound good? All right. Do you have any Tips to get into i3, I'm not familiar with it at all, sadly. Um, actually, it's very good to watch a stream on the phone before going to sleep. Oh, that's fair. I always have problems on my phone because I just get, like, neck strain because I just never, like, I either get arm strain or neck strain because I'm holding my phone in a way that's easy or I'm fold holding my phone because my arm is lazy and then my neck hurts. Just kind of sucks. Is this hacking? Yes, it is. Hello, Cash Override. How are you doing? Watching on the phone rather frequently during lunch, etc. I guess that makes sense. I uh, I have no obligations in life, so I can just be at my computer for 
uh, 18 hours a day and no one cares. So I kind of have that, that luxury. Um, since you said it's applicable to all kinds of targets, including ARM or Android, why not emulate with QMU? Where are the QMU limitations? Uh, largely, the limitations with QMU are A, it's typically harder to work with because it's much more complex and it handles more edge cases. Uh, and B, QMU is not designed to be fast and reset quickly. It's designed to execute fast, but it's not designed to be easily instrumented or to be uh, reset quickly. So in our example, we want to be able to reset millions of times a second, and QMU would struggle to do that hundreds of times a second. If not, it would maybe, luckily, with some of the academic papers that are going out to make it reset faster, push thousands of resets a second. And we're doing millions on a single core, no problem. We're not doing anything meaningful with it because most fuzz cases are larger than that, but we're not bottlenecking at all on a reset capability. Second of all, the adding instrumentation to something like QMU is extraordinarily difficult. They have multiple optimization passes, they have multiple different ILs that they use, and they have multiple translation layers for different targets. So if I wanted to add something where I would hook memory reads, it would actually be very difficult. I would have to go and either write something in their IL, which might be too restrictive because it's meant to run in the guest's kind of memory space, uh, or I would have to um, end up writing my own like JIT for the specific instructions that get uh, um, emit. Second of all, it's a little bit more spread out. There are multiple different implementations of the same loads and stores. And for, for our example, we actually have uh, one location for that. So like the load uh, instructions all happen in here. So if we wanted to hook all loads on the system, all we have to do is just add something here that maybe uh, logs what load occurred. And this would hook every single possible load that can occur. Uh, and in the other way, we can look, hook every single store that occurs. And it just makes it a lot easier for us to add instrumentation. Um, that being said, it's a lot more work to emulate devices and all those things. So you benefit from that from QMU. But typically, you don't have to emulate devices when you're fuzzing targets. You can emulate APIs. For example, you don't need to emulate a network card because you can just hook send and receive, and you're dealing with big slices of, of, uh, of data rather than dealing with packets and TCP headers and checksums. Um, so there are typically ways that you can cheat your way around the more complex things, make it easier for yourself, and then benefit from the performance because now you're not emulating multiple device accesses or sending one meg over the network uh, if you hook at receive is just writing one meg to memory versus if you emulate a device, you have to emulate uh, multiple receives, multiple packets, the processing of those packets, the checksumming of those packets, sending interrupts, waiting for interrupts to get handled, and it just can get much slower. That being said, it's more accurate, and you can potentially hit more surface there. For example, you might be able to fuzz the TCP stack if you go that route. That being said, if you're fuzzing the TCP stack, then you're fuzzing the TCP stack. If you're fuzzing a userland application that's receiving network data, you probably don't care about fuzzing the TCP stack because you don't have the time or energy to handle two targets at the same time. So, okay. Good morning, Mozo. Another power outage. I have not had one uh, since the one on Monday. Aren't you tired from yesterday's stream? No, not at all. It wasn't too bad. Um, let's see. Pog donut. Was there a donation? You know what? I don't have a way of viewing my donation alerts, and I think there was a donation I missed yesterday. Let me see how I can view those because they don't show up in my stream manager, and I think they show up on screen, and then I never f fucking see them. So I'm sorry about that. Let me see. I think Streamlabs will tell me. I'll see if their dashboard tells me. Um, recent events? Question mark? Bitwise with the 30 bucks. Thank you so much, Bitwise. And then yesterday I got a 30 bucks from Out of the Gray. Holy shit, I'm a terrible streamer. You know, I've probably missed, like, all the donations that aren't the bits or whatever. Actually, it looks like those are the main ones. So thank you so much for that. PogChamp, that's, uh, that's, 
That's some good eating today, then. <laughs> Stream cut off abruptly yesterday? Uh, it shouldn't have. I had people chatting with me and talking with me. So I don't think it did. Until the end, I had a normal normal exit there. So maybe something fucked up on Twitch's end or, or on your end, but uh, I definitely was talking with people until the end there. It just confirms you're not in it for the money. I don't think there is a large enough viewer base for this level of technical content for me to ever get wrapped up in chasing the money. <laughs> like, like, I would say the maximum I could probably average would be like a thousand viewers. I could get that if like a Kit Boga or someone referenced me because he does programming streams along with his um, uh, scamming streams and he gets like a thousand people watching that but he's a lot more entertaining, he's better at chat, he has a more professionally produced stream, he does voices, he might have a call come up at any time and he's doing things that are much more approachable and accessible and he struggles to get a thousand people during his programming streams. So there's just... I'm not saying there's no hope, because that's just a grim view, but I don't think this level of content really can support more than 100 to 200 people. Kid Boga's hilarious. Yeah, I love his stuff, man. I watch him pretty much any time he's on stream. <laughs> and there we go, Desu. Test donation, please ignore. Thank you so much, Desu. Or Michael Reeves with 15k. Yeah, I mean, it's just... The programming that I do is just more boring. If it's We're not working on GUIs. We don't see anything happen. We, you don't see anything get rendered. We don't have a website that gets a layout. We don't do any design. We don't draw anything. It's just we stare at text in code, and then we run commands... And then we see good text, and we get happy because text is really nice. Um, maybe we add some colors to the to the terminal, throw some ANSI colors in there. But that's that's about as flashy as you get. So my audience is pretty much people who are genuinely interested in the raw content and the raw programming. And there just aren't that many people out there who'd like to watch programming when they could be watching uh, many other streams on on the service. <laughs> Who's the programmer guy who has a thousand viewers? Uh, if you mean who I was mentioning, Kit Boga. Um, but I think there are like a couple other programmers who get a lot of viewers. But they're pretty much all either game programmers, which is a lot more flashy and a lot more accessible. And I think non-developers can watch game programmers and just enjoy kind of the behind-the-scenes flavor. Whereas here, what is the relatability here? When would a non-developer really get anything out of this stream? <laughs> it's just code and text. <laughs> and maybe some rants. But the rants are always about, like, deeply technical things or industry or academia, which is like, once again, who cares about academia gossip? <laughs> it's just like, it's like... It's the most niche fucking gossip you can get. <laughs> Camozo scene. You know, I do see people come by and they say, I have no idea what's going on, but I'm still enjoying it, which I think bodes decently well for my personality. I, I, I'll, the confidence will get there one day, but I don't know. It's kind of cool when people stop by and they're like, I don't know what the fuck you're doing. I think... People who like watching game streams might enjoy something like this, but they're just never going to seek it out or find it. So, it's called passion. <laughs> just make some memes. Redrill. <laughs> hobbyist, so not a real programmer, still here. I mean, a hobbyist, like, I'm a hobbyist programmer. I mean, arguably, I, I make money for doing programming-related things, but I'm not employed as a programmer. No clue what is happening, but I'm sure it's smart. I mean, I don't know how fun it is to watch smart people do smart things. I mean, to be honest, I'm pretty sure I would have tuned into Einstein just doing random lab experiments and drawing doodles on a on a chalkboard. Um, 
Not saying I'm Einstein. Wow, that sounded fucking pretentious as shit. But on the topic of just watching people do things because it's smart, um, there, there, there might be a market there. <laughs> Maybe beginner stuff, really breaking it down. I just suck at pacing. <laughs> I really suck at pacing. I think I would love to be a good teacher. I do like the concepts of teaching, and I like the allure of teaching, um, but I just, I think I get too lazy, and I get too wrapped up in, like, doing nutty things. I mean, we were doing fuzzing stuff earlier, and then we went and wrote an emulator, um, now we're gonna learn from it. I hope, like yesterday, when we talked about the fuzz graphs and we displayed those and we wrote the dice roller, I hope there are good takeaways there. But I also recognize that we probably went a little bit out of scope. <laughs> um, you're the most entertaining systems level program on Twitch. Well, I'm glad I'm number one out of the one one to. Two people who do it. <laughs> um, is the most entertaining person who types things into computers on Twitch? Ooh, that's a, that's a hot take right there. Ah, that's why we modded you, I think, because of the good, uh, good words. Um, <laughs> what I like in your streams is even though it's super advanced, is that you start from scratch? Yeah, I mean, that's just my flaw, which, you know... It kind of, so here's the thing. I have to pretend like writing things from scratch like I do is a bad idea and that I waste a lot of time by reinventing the wheel and I spend a lot of time not using libraries and people in chat are always saying, why aren't you just using a library? You'd save so much time. And I'd like to say that. Um... But at the end of the day, I wouldn't be able to do anything that you see on stream if I didn't deeply understand how everything is written from scratch. Because for some fucking reason, my brain doesn't trust other code. And I don't mean that from a security perspective. I just mean it from like a doing the, the right thing or having the right scaling properties or just like working correctly. I feel like every single, and I've tried, in like the past two years, I've used more libraries than I've ever used, and I regret it every fucking time. Every time I grab a library, I immediately regret it. Either it crashes, or it adds entropy, or it breaks my own program because they have bugs in their stuff, or the performance of it just makes no sense. It like does things that I know I could do a million times a second, and it does like one every 10 seconds. And sometimes I just don't even remotely understand what some software is doing. Like OS boot times. My OS boots and can launch a hypervisor and can launch Windows from over the network that is downloaded dynamically and it does it in under like half a second. So how the fuck do you boot in like a minute for normal Windows? How? What are you possibly doing? Except for, like, one second sleeps because you have race conditions that you didn't actually solve the problems of. So now you just have sleeps in a million threads during the boot process. <laughs> I get that. I just have to know what the code is doing. Yeah. I just... I don't know. I like reinventing the wheel. I, I've reinvented wheels and basically all the wheels I reinvent happen to be a lot faster. There's a reason why F1 isn't done with wooden wagon wheels. Um, let's see. Definitely not a flaw. It's super helpful. I do think that is one of the reasons why my content can be uh, entertaining. Because I, I kind of do everything from scratch. And that means you get to kind of see... A lot of things that typically people would just chalk up to uh, pull in a library and just write two lines of code and it will solve the problem for me. And we'll go down a lot of paths implementing more complex ways and faster ways and talk through why we do things uh, certain ways. Um, learned a lot from your stream. Seeing that advanced stuff being implemented from scratch helps a lot. That's so great to hear. I do think, I mean... 
I just don't understand how to build things with Legos when it comes to like, when I read like an academic paper, and this time I'm not shitting on academic papers, I'm just saying I don't understand. Like, you look at something and it's like, they wrote what, 400 lines of Python? And just glued in like 40 different libraries. And they get something to work. I'm not capable of doing that. I'm, I don't have the ability to like go out and find these libraries and get them to work together. Because typically they don't. Um, I do respect that. But I also think that is part of the reason why I have a lot of criticisms of academia. Because I just go and I'm like, why aren't you just doing this where you can do it a million times a second? And they're like trying to fight to get a thousand a second and I'm like what are you possibly doing and then I realized well it's because they're using other people's code and they have absolutely zero say in the performance properties of what they're doing <sighs> um let's see do you do anything with FPGAs I did Huh. What have I done on FPGAs? I wrote an 8-bit CPU that basically had it was it was Turing complete, but it basically only could do like adds and conditional branches and it was limited to like a couple hundred bytes of SRAM cuz I was too lazy to get a DRAM controller working. Uh, and that probably was no more than 500 lines of, of VHDL, I think is what I used. So, and then I wrote some VHDL for some, uh, from like observing, uh, for like handling some radio signals. So like some filtering of radio signals. And that's it. I don't know how to do FPGA stuff. I do like it. If FPGAs had the ability to have faster caches, I would I could guarantee that almost all of my research would happen on FPGAs. But unfortunately, FPGAs basically suck for random accesses. They're really only good for streaming memory accesses. Because you can get the full 100 to 400 gigabytes per second of modern DDR bandwidth on an FPGA. No problem. That's a complete joke. But you can't get 4-cycle latency in a 32k cache, and then 18-cycle latency for a 200k cache, and 50-cycle latency for a couple meg cache. It's just, you can't get those sorts of things, so pretty much random accesses are out of the picture. I would love for that to be the case, because if that were the case, this, this emulator would be written to run on an FPGA. Like, I would go and buy the most expensive FPGA I could buy, and I'd go buy 50 of them, and I'd have a custom board spun where all of them are working together, and I'd make my own IL that would effectively run directly on the FPGA, and it would be such a reduced instruction set that I'd have 50 or 60 cores per FPGA, and I'd have thousands of my IL cores, and then I could directly do instrumentation and coverage and tracing in hardware like tapping off of instruction handlers to have them uh, break compares into byte compares and reporting that coverage information, but do it in hardware. Um, it is very much so something I want to do, but the performance of caches and random accesses would be so slow that even if I got a like 50x speed up in the simplicity and the design of everything, I don't think I could make up for it, uh, make up for the losses I would get from the memory bandwidth uh, hit. So, I'd love for that to be the case. If I am wrong there, if anyone understands FPGAs more and they're like, just spend five grand and get one gig of SRAM and hook it up to the parallel lines of the FPGA and you can get fast, like, uh, like one gigahertz uh, access times or something like that to chips, then I'd fucking do that. I can I can pay to win that problem away. They sell those for ASIC development. It's like one million dollars. Yeah. So I I expect that in my lifetime I will have an ASIC an, an ASIC made. Um, it's expensive, but it's uh, it's possible, but it's freaking expensive. Yeah. But how expensive is it? Because I'm pretty sure I could get probably a 10 or a 20x cost effectiveness increase 
um, just due to using like a reduced set. Because I can emulate floating point with a like right now we're running a risk vi. Risk V sixty four I, which has no floating point, it doesn't even have divs and mulls, and that's very similar to what I would implement in an FPGA. I would have no divs, no mulls, none of that circuitry that takes up so many logic gates, and I would use that to spray and pray more and more and more and more cores on the chip. Um, I'm pretty sure I could get like a ten x cost. Efficiency gain compared to x86 for, for fuzzing, assuming I could get similar uh, memory latencies. So the question is, can I get good latencies with a 10x uh, perform like and not eat too much into that 10x advantage? For example, if I spent 10 grand on FPGAs, I think I could make them equal to about 100 grand in x86 compute specifically for fuzzing. For example, we could implement a byte-level MMU in hardware such that we would have ASAN in hardware, so one byte out of bounds would cause a crash, and we could also make sure that crashes don't go through expensive exception handling routines. Uh, there wouldn't be privilege levels or interrupts. There's a lot of stuff that we could save that we don't need for emulation. Um, and I'm pretty sure, so basically, for 90 grand, can I get fast latency on, uh, on memory? And I don't know if the answer is true or not. You can get FPGAs with HBM. Well, HBM is great for throughput, but it's not good for latency. HBM actually has worse latency. Well, the last time I used HBM, uh, which maybe I think they're on HBM 2 or 3 now, um, the first generation of HBM that I used, maybe it was the implementation, uh, had like... 30 or 40 percent higher latencies than DRAM, but it had 4x the throughput. So it's great for scientific compute, but not good for running programs which do a lot of random accesses. Uh, if you were jitting risk of uh, v floating point on x86, would you be able to directly use x86 floating point instructions, or are there, pre or are there precision differences that need to be accounted for? Um, I am not quite sure. I know things like ARM have multiple different precision modes, and so does x86. x86, you can control the rounding modes. I know RISC-V and x86 both use the same IEEE representation of floats, IEEE 784, I think. Um, so they would be compatible at a bit level, and then the question is, are the operations identical? And the other question is, does it matter? Does it matter if I emulate it bit for bit the exact same way in Risk Five? Because ultimately, if it's good enough for x86, it's probably good enough for Risk Five, and I can't imagine finding a memory corruption bug due to uh, a one-bit rounding error, which causes a one times ten to the negative eighteen difference in results. Um, if I wanted it to be true emulation, yes, I would care about that, but I don't think it would really actually matter. In fact, I don't even think the representation would matter. Um, even if x86 used a different representation, I could literally do the native x86 floating point arithmetic, and then when a conversion instruction occurs, a direct bit level conversion, then I could perform the um, translation at that level. Um, that might require taint tracking for things like uh, floating points in memory, where you would have to detect if it's being used for a floating point operation or for an integer operation, but you could potentially just do the conversion lazily when it gets used in different modes. Um, just thinking like for correctness, uh, x86 in some cases uses 8-bit internal re registers or double-sized floating point. Yeah, so x86 is mainly 32 and 64-bit floating points now, which are fully comp compatible with IEEE. They do have 80-bit, but you have to use the FPU, and no one does that on 64-bit. Google is going to start offering free ASICs for projects as long as they're completely open source. It's only a 130 millimeter uh, nanometer process, so it'll mostly be for microcontrollers. Yeah, that's a little bit thick. I think if I wanted to fab something, I would probably go for 32 to 45. Um, I don't think 15 will get me that much, but I think 32 to 45, I mean, that's basically 2008 tech. Um, I think that would be adequate for most of the things I would do, and I'd get to do it cheaper. Um, let's see. 
For ASIC, you need to pay for producing at least for 100k chips. No foundry will produ produce few chips. Not to mention verification and design. So, yeah, I'm I'm curious on if if we could get some of that stuff cheaper. Uh, I guess that makes sense th uh, that they don't use larger precision internals for SIMD. Yeah, yeah, only 64-bit for those. After all, you can only fit a limited number of dies in the wafer. Uh, this is limiting the amount of project, yeah. Do you have any tutorials to learn the basics of fuzzing? Not really. Kind of this week a little bit, but I think we failed a little bit to make it too basic. I've done a couple things, like the first day of this week and Kellogg fuzzing I think were pretty basic. Uh, but then we kind of threw that away. Okay. Um, so, basically, what we want to do is we want to go and, uh, just run this, because I'm pretty sure I have it in debug mode, and I have it, uh, I think I turned off mutation. Yeah, so right now, it picks the same file, which is from the corpus, and it does no mutation. So this right now is doing the same thing over and over. More specifically, this is logging all of the traces. Right now, it's saving it to disk, because it's a big trace. Uh, and we're going to look through it, and we're going to see if there's anything that looks egregious. Uh, if there's anything in here which is not controlled by the fuzz case. And if there are things that aren't controlled by the fuzz case, we can look into um, how much time we're spending on those things, and if we can optimize any of those things out. So, this, this dumped a PC trace and a trace. So, PC trace are all of the instructions, or... It's all of the PC addresses of what got executed. And trace, which is a 1.4 gig file, um, is uh, it's the register state for every before the execution of every single instruction. Um, and this means that we can go and post-process this and use this to determine if something looks wrong. For example, if we saw something loop and spend 99% of the CPU time, and we looked, we could verify we might have a bug in our own stuff where we're doing a shift wrong, which is causing us to loop more iterations than we're supposed to, which is a common issue I see. Um, let's see. Just a quick question. Why do you implement assembly instructions rather than Rust code for add some and so forth? Uh, I remember you were just using regular equations like A plus B for add. Um, are, are you looking at, at like this stuff now? Because this is a JIT. Yeah, this is a JIT. This generates code which is then run uh, directly, and it's not interpreted at all. Um... That's the difference between interpreting and jitting. Yeah, the assembly code is being created at runtime. Yep. Basically, we're creating a program, and then we run that program. So I actually would like to experiment, because I theory crafted with this before. Um, it's kind of crazy. Uh, but I think I can write an emulator that gener or a JIT that generates Rust. And here's what I'm thinking. And this is fucking crazy. Um, the problem is this. This is relying on the compiler to be incredibly smart. Otherwise, it doesn't work. But I have this idea where I'll write an emulator. Well, this will be like inst foo. And this is like literally I will emit code for every instruction. And then this will take in, let's say, racks and rbx as mutes. And let's say... This is an add instruction, so we're going to say racks plus equals rbx, and then this calls inst f004, which is the next instruction, and then this will pass in racks and rbx, so it'll pass the args, and then we'll have inst foo4, and let's say this will minus equals rbx, and then let's just say that's the end of execution or something. Um, so I could generate code like this, and the Rust compiler is smart enough to recognize that those cancel out. And it's also smart enough to recognize that it doesn't need to make a call from each of these. Now, if I don't have any optimization, you see very, like, this will actually call the other thing. But with optimization, 
it won't actually call it. So I'm pretty sure I could chain instructions like this where I would emit Rust code that does what the instruction does, and then I would have to make sure that it's guaranteed that there's no way that the instruction can re-enter itself, and Rust will hopefully never actually issue a function call. If it issues a single function call, it will infinitely recurse. Because if a single function call occurs, it'll push things to the stack, and now the stack's being used, and you'll execute a loop, and you'll accumulate a stack. This is really something I would like to play around with. Uh, further, if I said this was racks minus equals rbx plus 4, um, and then I have to return the, the state or something where I could say, let's do this. Um, VM exit racks rbx, where I return control. And then here we can say extern uh, fn vm exits u64 u64, and I think I have to name these, um, racks and rbx. So let's say that's some external thing it can't optimize out. So look at the code that it generates. For the foo instruction, it takes rdi, which is racks, and subtracts 4, even though we add rbx, and then we subtract rbx and add 4, because it gets rid of the call to the next function. It then finds out that that's a nop, and then only shows you what actually happens from that emulation, um, or from that, uh, from that emission. Um, and then further, insto4 is still a valid thing that you can call, and if you end up directly calling insto4, or someone branches to inst fo4, you can end up executing that, and that one has the correct code. It subtracts rbx, and then subtracts an additional 4, and then jumps to vm exit. So, I'm pretty sure I can do this. Um, now the question is, when I end up having literally tens of thousands of these functions, does the Rust compiler ever choke to analyze the dependency chain? Because if it ever does, or if it has a threshold of amount of time it's willing to invest in the optimization, then it could maybe at the end just be like, that's too deep, we're not optimizing past this point, fuck it, issue the function call, now we have a function call, now we have stack utilization, and now we have recursion that could occur and could exhaust our own stack. Um, what would the benefit of this would be? This would be extraordinarily fast. This would be much, much, much faster than um, the JIT that I'm emitting, where every single read and write of a register is exactly as it's emit in the code itself, and uh, it's a read and write of memory. All registers turn into memory accesses, and this could uh, really analyze it. Maybe you could add a pass to LVM IR. So you can tune a lot of LVM uh, stuff. You can pass, like loop unrolling limits and you could just set it to like 2 billion and that would hopefully do the trick um why wouldn't you emit multiple instructions in a single function because there's kind of no reason to right i could literally just emit all of the all of the instructions as separate functions and then chain them based on calls and then that way i would have less code potentially the compiler would basically be able to reason about the amount of code to bring in through dce rather than me trying to figure out what a block is because then if i go and jump into the middle of the block we're gonna have a lot of duplicate code um so why won't you directly use lvm ir uh, lvm ir is just a lot harder to work with, right? The goal of this would be, it would be super obvious what it's doing, right? It would be super obvious how to instrument it. And further, if we wanted to add a hook or a breakpoint to insto4, we can do like, uh, we can add the breakpoint directly here where we can do like uh, vm exit breakpoint would be the reason, and then you pass the registers out, right? And we can just add that. If we wanted to add this in LVM IR, it's a lot more complex than just writing a function. There's also very little resources for learning how to do LVMR. So if I made a JIT that did this and emit Rust, all you have to do is know how to write Rust, and you could instrument it and make changes and make improvements or at make additions. If it's LVMIR, you need to be pretty fucking specialized to make use or changes to it. Um... 
The reason is you wouldn't be uh, fighting against the compiler's willingness to inline multiple calls. The, the problem is whether you do it at a block or instruction level isn't a huge difference, right? There's probably like eight instructions per block on average, so it's a factor of eight difference. But we're still going to end up having chains of thousands of blocks, and we're already going to hit kind of the same limits regardless. Why do you think LVM IR is harder to use? Well, because Rust is designed for humans to program in, and LVM IR is not. Um... Yeah, so, so the goal would be, like, I would just emit a function for all of these things, and then hopefully Rust would chain everything in the call. So, for example, let's say this can't be inlined. But this, still, this doesn't issue a stack, um, a stack call, right? It doesn't issue a call to the next instruction. It issues a jump. So here's the thing. This works no problem as long as it never does a call or uses the stack. Well, it can use the stack, but it can't do a call. Because the second there's a call, if the call happens in a loop, we run out of a stack on our host. But in this situation... Yeah, it's just tail call. So all we have to do is make sure that the code that we produce has no exit point that kind of differs um, or is dynamic. So the question is, how do we handle dynamic calls? So I think we need um, something like this, inst, where this is a function u64, u64s, and this would be a slice, and then this would be a table of the instructions, and we'd have inst foo, and we'd have inst, uh, oops, inst foo, and uh, not that, and then this would be an inst fo4. So dynamic calls are something that could be potentially tough to figure out. Um, we'll say unsafe fn, not that it matters. Um, and then let's say if, uh, let's say this is going to call insts racks mod uh two right um and then call it with racks rbx um as u size mon two and there we go that is a jump as well so this an indirect jump also works now if it wasn't provably uh in bounds of that then we'll have a call to panic but we still have a jump in the common path, and the call to panic is acceptable in this case. Um, I don't know. I'm pretty sure we can do this. You can't get LVM to do reliable tail code optimization. Well, the thing is, these functions are going to be very, very, very simple, right? Like, what are you possibly going to do here that involves an if statement or conditionals or really anything dynamic? I... I don't think it's really possible to screw up tail call optimization in, in these functions, right? We're not generating massive, massive functions. Now, the question is, will these get combined into a function, and then it turns into a complex equation, and then it fails to tail call optimize? Um, I'm not sure. Regarding tail call, I'm talking about this, which is story of tail call optimizations in Rust. And I think Rust does some stuff on it, too. Um, it works to solve fundamental... Yep, yep, yep. Um, let's see. Oh, interesting. It's not in Rusty. It's just LVM. But it's an optimization, not a reliable thing. Yeah, that's why I'm uncomfortable about doing this. Um, but I do actually think that these instructions will be simple enough, right? We're not going to be accessing globals. We're not doing anything sophisticated. I'm pretty sure it could actually optimize this. I think... Since today is still fuzz week, I don't think we're going to explore this, but I think tomorrow 
I might try to write uh, our JIT in this way. And the other thing that's really, really cool is for, an, uh, for something like RISC-V that has aligned instructions and four-byte instructions, we can literally go through and we can have every single, inst we can just go through and read every single four bytes in executable memory and put it in a table and disassemble it. It doesn't matter if it's actually an instruction or not. We don't care if the instruction actually is valid because if it's not valid, we just omit what that instruction does. If it's an undefined opcode, then we omit a VM exit undefined opcode. If it's valid and it just makes no sense, it's like a move from arbitrary memory, that's still an instruction. Um, and then that way we don't have to worry about trying to figure out the jump targets for things. Just disassemble every instruction and then link the instructions together based on where they're going and you're done. And I'm pretty sure you could just compile it and it would all get optimized. It's, you could also do it for x86 or something that is variable length. You would do it for every byte offset. You would decode one instruction and omit the code for that instruction. And then you'd chain them together based on their addresses. And then you'd have a table that you could index to find the dynamic function dispatches. Like, seriously, I think this would work. And this would lead to incredibly good code. I would say this would probably be like a 20 to 50% slowdown from native, assuming you don't have optimization issues. It would just basically be native execution. And it would be very obvious to instrument. It'd be very obvious to change the uh, behavior of what the instructions do. I don't know. This is what I'm thinking about doing tomorrow. I think I still want to stick to fuzzing stuff today, unless people really want to see this. Because I do think we can do this. Can you also do ahead of time compiling? Yeah, that's what I would do. Basically, I would read the entire code section. Basically, um, what, what I would do is I'd make it so you can load things into memory. Right, so like in our case, you make a new emulator and we load up an elf and you add memory and you modify things and you hook functions and you knock things out and you do whatever you want. And then I would have a certain function call that would basically be like emu dot uh, compile. And at that stage, no more executable memory would be allowed to be added and no writable and execu executable memory would be allowed either. It would basically say, no, you can no longer introduce, remove, or change existing executable code. And then I would go through every single aligned 4-byte offset in executable sections, decode the RISC-V instruction, omit Rust that corresponds to it, wrap it in a function that's inst underscore the hexadecimal address of where it is loaded, generate a big Rust file that would be probably 100,000 lines of code, and compile it. And then you just call functions. Like, I would just mark everything here as extern, and you would just, to start executing at inst foo, you would call inst foo. And then I'd have a table that would contain the dynamic lookup so that you could index it based on the, an address rather than a symbol name, which is compile time. And that would allow you to jump into an arbitrary place and just execute. Um, I don't know. I, I seriously think this would work. And I think this would be one of the highest performance emulators out there. It would probably take two minutes to compile it, but it would, it would probably only take like five seconds to generate the Rust code. And then we could hash the input file and we could cache it. We could cache the output, but yeah, it might take a minute or whatever to compile it, but you do it once per binary. And then you only have to do it, um, and we could literally hash the binary, or we could hash the produced code, such that if we ever change the code, we'd re-emit the binary, so that if you add a hook, it would know that something changed. I'm pretty sure this would work. Like, and the other thing is, it would be safe. It would be safe. You would literally pass in memory as a slice. This would be like guest mem would be a slice. Everything in here would be marked safe. 
It would be impossible to have the guest corrupt the host. There's no way it's possible. Isn't that fucking neat? <laughs> I've been talking about this for like three months with coworkers and friends, and I think tomorrow's the day we try it. If it works, this would be insane. Someone wrote a JIT for Ruby that I'll put in C and compile it with GCC. Yeah, I think it would work. The only issue is we don't, we need TCO. We need tail code optimization because if it, does that call concept make sense? Basically, if you ever have a call, that means that if something jumps back to the instruction that does a call in a loop, you end up with infinite recursion. Now, we could allocate a one gig stack. Like, I don't give a shit. We can, we can do that if we really want to. We can make a gigantic stack and then just cross our fingers that nothing recurses that hard, but it's still possible. Um, sounds like another stab at what sing Singularity tried to do. I don't know. I just, nothing about this seems really novel or complex or crazy. I just think it works. And like this optimization, looking at this just makes me giddy with joy. The, the optimization in, uh, yeah, we'll do this, RBX. Um, blah, blah, blah. Call to unsafe. Yeah, none of this stuff is unsafe. Oh, the VM exit is, right? So the VM exit is like an end condition or a syscall or something. And this just makes me so happy. It's so simple. It's so simple. Like, racks plus equals four racks minus equals rbx like we can emit shitty code we could emit shitty code like this because we just lift very naively and the compiler will just solve that problem for us and we're just emitting rust code so it's not like we have to understand lvm ir we don't have to worry about safety we don't have to worry about how memory is laid out we just pass in a slice that's memory and a slice that's permissions and we access it like and then rust does all the uh, checks on the bounds checking of everything and it just everything works <laughs> and we could have an unsafe mode that would then use the like get unchecked on array accesses if you're running like trusted code or you want go fast juice and then it will just deref memory but like i don't see why this wouldn't work like i don't really see any function being complex here the most comp complex thing would be a conditional branch that would look exactly like something like this and in that situation i don't think tco is gonna fail here i don't know i really want to do this you guys want to try this because i feel like if this works we can do so many crazy things with this for fuzzing and research and also it'll be much easier to get right um um Let's do it. Then you just have, uh, do you then just have to pass the registers to every function? Yeah, I think you have to pass them like this because if you pass the functions, if you pass them in memory, I think it, it, it requires that they are in memory. Um, so let's say these are regs. I'm pretty sure it will still have to operate on them in memory, and we might lose some uh, performance from that. So let's say reg zero plus equals reg one, reg zero. I would like to do it in memory, that would be nice, but I'm pretty sure the memory access can start causing some issues. Um, and we also would have this be a mutable uh, fixed size array so that it doesn't ever emit a bounds check, uh, or more specifically, the bounds checks would be decided at compile time. So, reg, reg, like this is, I would prefer to do it like this, right? But I don't know how much it can optimize uh, memory accesses. Uh, oh, foo four. And rack's not found in a scope, yep, reg zero. And expected function pointer. Found item. Oh, yep, this too. 
And VM exit, expected two parameters, yep. So what we would do is when we would write this code, we would make the prototype, we would just make that a macro or something that could expand so we could very quickly change the formatting of these arguments uh, such that we could make decisions like this with not a uh, large cost. But yeah, so in this case, this is now memory accesses, right? So I think we just pass them in as registers and it can optimize this better. Obviously it has to pass all of them on the stack or something during an, uh, a long call. Although it's, since it's passing ownership, um, with tail code optimization, I'm pretty sure it won't do memory access. But this to me is unacceptable. Um, Cause now we're doing memory access for something that really shouldn't be a memory access. Are there situations where, where mutation-based fuzzing is extremely weak and you'd rather go for generation-based generation fuzzing? I typically don't really make it an and or, I typically do both pretty much in every circumstance. But uh, mutation-based fuzzing is typically very weak against targets where you can't get a good corpus. And um, getting a good corpus is hard. Like for example, we're fuzzing object dump right now. I would say the corpus that we have is unacceptable. I would say a good corpus for object dump, uh, we would write a tool that would crawl um, maybe like a Debian repo or uh, different OS repos, and it would crawl all of the architectures and pull down like five random binaries um, from random architect, well, five random binaries from each architecture, right? Because right now we're only stressing x86-64. We're only stressing things that are compiled with Debian's toolchain, which is GCC, which is a specific version that uses specific versions of dwarf symbols. Um, making a good corpus is hard, right? Object dump parses dwarf information. Well, there are like 10 different formats of debug information. There's a bunch of different versions of dwarf. There are a bunch of level, different levels of debugging information. There's a bunch of different symbolization differences. Uh, C++ will use mangling, C won't, so on and so forth. Um, generating a good corpus is difficult. And I would say pretty much every single like fuzzer out there, I could outperform with a byte flipper because I can make a better corpus because I understand how important making a corpus is. And um, that's what we're going to demonstrate. I am, fuzz week is not going to be over until I show you the impact of a good corpus because I can show you that a good corpus will easily get like a 40% increase in coverage and it will find all the coverage like 50x faster just by having a good corpus. It's so important. We stream about generation-based fuzzing? Yeah, we'll probably uh, do a little bit of that on, on this. It probably won't be fuzz week anymore. I think we should try and do this because right now I am having second guesses about our JIT. There's a lot of things here that I think could be a lot faster. Um, we've looked at our JIT code, right? We've looked at our output and it's not good. Um, and since it's assembly, um, and since it's assembly, it is getting a MIT as is, right? Uh, so the, all the instructions that we emit here will get executed, which kind of sucks. So as an uh, FW temp thread ID, doesn't matter. We'll just say one close paren dot asm, right? So we have a lot, a lot of memory access, right? This is literally just subtracting 16 from a register, but this could be doing a single sub quad word uh, 16, but we do it like this because every single read and write of a register is a memory access, unless it's inside the instruction, in which case we probably optimize it ourselves. Uh, we're not confident enough that we can actually fit things um, inside of certain uh, instruction boundaries. So we don't necessarily know if this constant fits that we can do a one-liner. We actually do in this case because it always would fit in a one-liner. But then we couldn't genericize the way that we access registers so we couldn't easily swap out how we access memory uh, or registers. Um, if we did that, it would start to get really complex to have a way to place it into arbitrary instructions with arbitrary positions and flags and operands, right? We did this because it's easy and straightforward and obvious. Um, there's just, and like a lot of these things are not necessarily as fast as, as you could make them, right? 
And some of these memory accesses could be omit. The compiler could recognize that you're accessing the same thing. And since it's a mutable reference to memory, the compiler could actually cache things that are used uh, that are nearby each other. Um, the compiler, let's, let's try something. Let's implement in our example case, and I think this will be the final straw before we do it. Let's implement a one byte mem copy. So a mem copy that copies um, one byte of memory at a time. So let's say we are lifting some embedded code that does a one byte at a time mem copy, like the most basic possible mem copy. And let's see if the compiler is smart enough to re to um, to make them do like word or SSE copies, right? I still think Rust doesn't emit no alias annotations for mute references. Oh, interesting. So let's see. Huh, if you wrote no alias, then it would be able to Ah, so basically all memory accesses in Rust are going to actually have to kind of hit the memory. Um, does this make it a fuzz month? I mean, I can keep going. I've got no pressure right now. So this is racks. So let's say this is the entry point. So what we're going to write is we're going to write, this is going to be x86 because I can type it faster. Um, let's assume rcx is count, rax is dest, rbx is source, right? So this is mem copy, rax, rbx, rcx, right? And then the code that we're going to make a fake lifter for, z mute, mutable no alias, wait. So what does the alias what what does the aliasing properties uh, cause in Rust? Can someone explain that aliasing a little bit better to me? Because that's something I need to understand thoroughly, not something I need to like understand the terminology of. So basically, by saying no alias for mutable memory, you say no one else can access this memory, right? And thus, the compiler is able to assume that if you write to that memory and you still have the mutable reference that no one else has modified something while it's running. And thus it can const prop it. Aliasing is when two refs and pointers do the same thing. When the compiler knows about two pointers pointing to different things, it can do some op optimizations. Yeah. Is it safe? to treat all mutable as no alias. Like, there must be a reason that they don't, right? Is that for performance reasons? Like, compiler time performance reasons? Or is there some unsoundness there? It's safe, L... Oh. Interesting, what are the bugs? Like, is that something we shouldn't use? Or for something that's as simple as this with not as complex of properties, do you think it's safe for this? Like, would that allow me to have the registers be in memory and it could then propagate things uh, directly from those? Or should we pass them explicitly like this? There's a different attribute for propagation of store load dependencies. Doesn't depend solely on no alias. Okay, so what optimizations does no alias allow that nothing that you don't get without it because it does sound like they do have some abilities to reason about that okay so here's our code we're gonna have a loop this is the entry point which will be at foo right so let's say this is at foo this is the loop and this is a move a move al um uh source rbx then we'll have foo4, and this is going to be a move rbx, uh, move destination, al, foo4, and then fo8 is going to be a decrement, 
um, decrement RCX, and then we'll say F O C will be a compare. Um, we're gonna use a MIPS instruction here because it's easier. Branch if not equal to zero to loop. So basically, read one byte from the source, write that one byte into the destination, decrement the number of bytes to copy. We're not checking if it's zero at the start. And then if it's not equal to zero, branch back to loop. Otherwise, at the end, F10, this is just VM exit, right? So this is like, we're done. So this instruction is the final. So let's implement this. So we need, and we're gonna see what Rust can optimize this to, because this might show that we can get some crazy optimizations for code which isn't optimized, right? This is a very unoptimized mem copy. Consider uh, A mute U size, B mute U size, A is one, B, A equals one, A equals B. Without no alias, the first store could have overwritten B as well. With no alias, it can optimize to A equals B. I see. First since clobber's destination. Oh yeah, and we also have to increment both. Let's just assume that this syntax exists, but it doesn't. Oh yeah, and that clobbers whatever. Okay, so we'll just say, um, we'll give it uh, DL is, is scratch, right? And then we're gonna say that this has the property of incrementing BX, right? This isn't real code. We're just making a use case that's similar to how it would actually look. Um, so then we need a mute RCX and a mute DL. And everything has to take this same prototype. And then here we will say, um, foo 48C10, 48C10. Ten. Oh, we need memory. Okay. Yeah, I probably should have made this a macro. In our code gen, we'll have a macro for something like this. And we probably should put the memory as the first arg, so it gets more bias towards being in a register across calls or jumps. Um, patterns aren't al are allowed in foreign. Okay, yep. And this, these are mute shit. Shit. Can I have a macro expand to this? I could have it pass in a structure, maybe. I could put everything in a structure, couldn't I? Um, pattern not allowed in foreign function. What? What did I? What did I do here? Oh, from extern. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, this builds. Um, now, so this will always end with a call of inst f04, because it's going to the next instruction, um, and it'll pass in all of the registers to there. And that's final. Okay, and then this one will go to eight, and eight will go to C, and then C is the conditional, and then this one will be a VM exit. Um, where's there? Called on safe. Okay. If LVM was able to use the Rust type system, uh, like aliasing, there'd be no doubt Rust will be faster than Fortran due to better optimization, known as the time and resources. Yeah. 
LVM is over-engineered and broken. Anyways, there's the whole forward progress debacle as well. Interesting. Okay, and macros can expand to args. So we can do that when we generate Rust code because we'll be making the, the code. But let's go and honestly, I think this is a better layout. Get to see a little bit more code. Okay. So now let's implement this instruction. And what does this do? This makes DL is equal to memory at RBX as you size, right? Um, oh, and, and we'll just say this is a U64, even though it's not, whatever. Then, make the font bigger. Oh, is it small? Okay, so read the memory, and I'm going to mark everything as unsafe because it doesn't change any safety, but we're going to add the ability to do get unchecked just so we can kind of peek into what Rust is actually emitting. Um, so here we'll say get unchecked, right? And this is just so we can see what Rust wants to emit, we can guess the, the cost and what's going to be added when it actually adds the uh, panics, but I just want to see. Okay, so it emits that read entirely because it's not necessary yet. So we load DL, and then we'll do RBX plus equals one, right? And I think that's the property of that instruction. So then FO4, this is going to then write memory at racks and it's going to write in the uh, deal as u8 and then racks will get updated by one um and oh get uh mute get checked unchecked mute thank you okay and then uh, F08 is RCX minus equals one, right? So store DL into racks, increment racks, decrement RCX, and then here we'll say if, and this branch can be resolved at compile time because the target is it's not a dynamic target. So we can say if um, RCX is not equal to zero, then we want to jump to loop, which is foo. So inst foo. Racks, RBX, RCX, DL, memory. Otherwise, if racks is equal to zero, and that's F00, zero, zero, then we go to inst F10. Racks, RBX, RCX, DL, memory. And let's see. FOC. So this is where the loop occurs. Ho! Oh. <laughs> you see what I'm saying, guys? Like, we would promote a, like, bite-level shitty mem copy that is in... Like, we would literally just emit exactly what the instruction fucking does... And we could lift a mem copy from an embedded ARM system or like an 8-bit system. And it would end up emitting bounds checks, alignment. This is fucking mem copy. This is like real big dick mem copy. <laughs> Muted? I shouldn't be. Test, 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 test. Check, check. Nope, my voice is there. Like... You see what I'm saying? You see why I feel like there's some merit here? Like, so if we jump to foo, it's going to do this. Uh, what is this doing? Move ECX, add RSI1, 
store the result, so it, there it does the copy, adds RDI1, decrements RCX, jumps to FOC, so the first byte, it kind of does naive, I think because they're all pub. And then, that'll jump, there are no calls in here, nowhere in this code is there a call, which means we don't have to worry about stack usage. And we see FOC here, literally is checking to see if it can do like, holy shit, optimize. Here, let's try this. See, target CPU is um, Skylake AVX 512. And there we go. We have it emitting. I guess this is just AVX 256, because it probably is not emitting AVX 512 for performance reasons because it doesn't want the down clocking, but look at this! Like, this is literally mem copy written in assembly, lifted naively into Rust, and then compiled, and look at this output! Would inline here help too? Um, not if they're already in the same compile unit. Can you call them all in order? What do you mean by that? Like, basically, this code already is valid. If I... If I was jumping to foo in the JIT, I just call foo. If I was jumping to FO4, I jump here. These are all correct. For example, if I were to jump to FO4, uh, for some reason, maybe I'm doing ROP and I'm doing a gadget, it would execute this and then it'd go to FOC, so it would be like an unaligned mem copy. But everything here is correct. Um, I'm actually okay with this. I can't emit better code than this. I can't, like... Even in my JIT, I can't emit better code than this. So even if it does this first, and then it jumps down to here, we're still getting a huge speed up, even if it didn't do the vectorization, which it's going to fucking do. Right? And then it, everything in here is a jump. There are no calls. It's smart enough to recognize it's literally mem copy. <laughs> and it will do this inside of a function. If inside of a function you do something that resembles a memcopy but it isn't actually memcopy, it'll still get optimized. You already did the tail call to the next instruction? I was thinking about uh, if each function did the instruction without a jump. Looks great to me. I just figure it'd be impressive to see the perf results. Yeah, I think we have to, we have to see. But like, this is nuts. And let's say if we just did get and uh, get mute, so we emit with the, um, I guess uh, we have to change this to this, um, and I will make this, when we emit the code, I will make this change uh, doable dynamically. So let's see if it still does vectorization here, because now it's bound checking. Okay, now it's not going to do it. So I think... We might have to help it out a little bit by writing our own bounds checking where we'll make our own memory accessors. In fact, we'll probably just have like pub fn read mem and then this will take in memory and it will read it and do permission checks and all of that stuff. And we can implement it with unsafe code, but we can still bounds check. But we know ahead of time how big of accesses we're doing. And then for things like reading memory that won't call an instruction, right? Reading memory won't call an instruction. The compiler could then make read mem a function call um, to reuse some of the code rather than spraying all the permission checks all over the place. Do a bounds check with the call to VM exits. Um, like on this first instruction. So here we go. So we have the read and then just the bounds check. It's just checking to make sure there's enough room to read RSI, which I'm guessing is RBX in this case. Unless you meant something else. But I, th I think this could work. Oh, can you do a perf comparison with this simple memcopy example that you've already got the Rust code and naive assembly for? Oh, um, sure. You, like, actually want to see the perf of it. Okay. Huh? Okay. Um, are you guys okay with the fact that this is not x86, and I can literally just make this um, JNZ loop, and I can make this uh, ink RBX and ink racks after this? No, I mean match memory.get RBX. Oh, I agree with you there, because that is likely what we'll end up doing. Um, 
get mute and then match this because that's literally what we want get this is it okay or error or some um uh, pointer pointer is uh oh get let dl is equal to this pointer and then none racks rbx rcx dl memory something like that right match arms have incompatible types um ooh it doesn't know that that doesn't return I would have to like put the code inside of here. Let me see if I can do this. Um, I think marking VM exit as no return might hurt things a little bit here. Uh, DL in F of four. Oh, in this case, this is uh as u64 and then match memory dot get mute some pointer pointer is uh dl as u8 none this no it can't reason about it there Damn. So I'm guessing if I did. Um, just passing all the CPU states through arguments. Yeah. And that's sufficient to let LVM implement emit something like that. Yep. This is just speeding up for emulated mem copy, though. You can't implement all the instructions like that, right? Well, I'm pretty sure I can. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I can because the compiler will do stuff like this until it's like whoa 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 I am unrolling way too much it'll have a threshold it will then issue an actual jump to the next instruction and then it will go through a basic one and expand again so it should expand in certain areas but not grow infinitely right what if you return VM exit instead of only calling it I actually think that's better than saying uh, no return here. I've had issues with no return hurting optimizations in Rust. So, move the X byte pointer, and that's FOC. So here, what's interesting is that this is all five instructions in one function. So it's still optimizing everything to one function, but it hasn't done the SSE stuff. Um, It includes calls. I don't think it does anymore. Yeah, it doesn't anymore. I've had issues with no return issuing calls because I played around with this a little bit before. But still, this code is much better. Even though it's still doing byte at a time, it's in internal to a function compared to if I were to emit this in a JIT, I would literally emit the code for this, and the code for this, and the code for this, and, and, that, and then I'd actually loop between jumps. Um, even though it's not optimizing this to use AVX, or even move them into multi-byte compares, it's still really, really good. Um, I don't know if I could get this to do multi-byte compares, to be honest. Um, so I could change this to a bounce check myself and I could say if we know it's a byte level access so I could say if rbx is greater than or equal to memory.len minus the access size uh, if it's greater than this not that it matters because it's one byte but I'm just trying to write how I would write this in code if rbx is greater than the memory length minus one 
correct? Because if it's equal to memory length minus one, that's inbounds, yeah. Uh, if it's greater than that, then return VM exit this. Otherwise, DL is memory get unchecked RBX. This should be roughly the same, but there's a chance that Rust optimizes this a little bit better. So then here we'll say uh, if racks is greater than that, and then in this case, get unchecked mute racks, assign it to, um, assign it from DLS U8. Um, and then this needs to be as a U size. We'll probably just have the registers as U sizes for funsies. Um, oh, this is DL is equal to this as U64. Okay. Nope. Yeah, it's the same. I think it's because of the, the chance of the early exit makes it a little spooked. Um, uh, we could try opt level three, but I don't think it'll change anything. I bet there's an LVM flag that we could use, but let's see, what, what code is it emitting? This is FOC. Can you put the meet into the conditional and the return in an else? So basically put the meet into here. And this doesn't return anymore. But it should be the same thing. Um, okay, if this is equal to that, if this is less than or equal to this, else, things like this can sometimes make a difference. I don't think they would in this simple of a case. Um, did we break Godbolt? Oh, uh, I typed some stuff in there. Yeah, it didn't change anything. Um, but let's see what F0C does. It checks if RDX is zero. If it's zero, then it goes to 3.7, which goes an XOR's EDX. Um, that's, see, that's kind of interesting to me. If this, if RDX is zero, then zero out RDX, uh, and then jump to the next thing, right? Once again, there's going to be like weird hiccups like that in generated code, but what's produced here is still wildly better than what I could possibly emit. Remember, every single time I access a register, every single time I access a register, it's a read or a write to memory. And this will move a lot of those reads and writes of registers outside of, outside of that. So then, if it's not equal to that, we'll subtract 9 to minus 1. This does the bounds check, right? This is doing the bounds check right here. This is then computing the addresses based on memory. So this is taking the base of memory and adding R sine RDI. So we are finding the, we're basically computing the memory pointer once ahead of time. Because uh, we, we have the base of memory, we have to add our offset into memory, and this does it once. Whereas in our case, we would do it every single memory access. It would emit uh, a, an arithmetic operation. It would be inside of a memory load, so it would be kind of okay. So then, XOR EAX EAX. We are then going to compute something here. I don't know what that one is. Then we come down to this, which is, this is reading the memory. Okay, this code gen's really weird. 
why would you do that? Why would you zero extend into EBX and then zero extend BL into ECX? Why don't you just move EBX into ECX? XR reg reg is essentially free on modern x86 processors? Yeah, it is. So that's then making a copy of it. Here we're checking. Uh, this is bound checking the destination. And then we're performing the move. So this is this is effectively right here. This is like four instructions. And we would end up emitting a like read DL. A read from register bank for uh, to get RBX, a write to register bank DL, a read from RBX to get that, to increment it, then to write it back out. We would have, like, literally just to do this one line, we would have uh, one load, nope, uh, two loads, two store, two loads and two stores of, of memory to do this one line. And in this case, we have a load in a store because we have to read memory and then we write to memory. And then it does the increments in nice batched ways such that that's all gonna get nice and optimized. And then it'll have the comparison. What's this doing here? I don't know. Uh, we can try and see how fast this is. I think this would be a good one to benchmark because this one is more accurate to how uh, to how my code would actually behave. Okay, so let's go into here. Um, Rust, JIT. So here we just have our test program. Okay, and now we should be able to call inst foo. Uh, let mute memory is vec ou8 1024. We want to read. That's the destination. Source is 128. The size we'll say is 128 bytes. DL is zero. Memory is memory. Um, oh yeah, and we don't have to call this return. Not that it matters. It's preparing for a call, pushing some callies saved reds. Yeah, LVM is incredibly stupid sometimes. Yes, it is. So then we'll call this. And then there's no implementation of VM exits. Um... I actually don't know how I get execution back from VM exit. And I can't really return because I have no way of returning the registers back. Um, I could have it return registers and move all of these into a structure called registers because I think Rust will optimize uh, as long as I don't pass it in as a reference to registers, and then I could have these directly return. Let's try that. So let's try struct registers, um, racks, rbx, rcx, rdx, and then memory. Uh, a mute u8. Okay. And then hopefully we can implement these in a way that we can say they take in registers and they return registers. And I'm going to comment these out and we'll get one working first before we do everything. But I'm pretty sure these will actually, this structure. If you pass it by move to a function, it'll behave the same way as passing in them as arguments. Um, so now we can do, let's do inst foo. Um, 
regs, registers, registers. I don't think I have to have lifetimes here. And then here I just have regs. Undeclared lifetime. Do I have to specify the lifetime here? I think I do. Uh, do I not? Okay, maybe I, I think I do. Uh, let me, regs is registers, um, racks is zero, rbx is 128, rcx is zero, rdx is zero. Uh, this is 128 bytes to copy. Memory is mute memory. Oh, we can do that. Nice. Uh, okay, so then we can do all of these. We change the prototype to this. And we can see... Oops. Cleans things up a little bit more. Um, paste, paste, paste. This is F10, I think. FOC, FO8, FO4. And then VM exit. This is actually uh, regs. Right, so VM exit no longer exists. This is just return regs. Okay. Uh, 62. This is just regs. Um, oh, yep. And then just get rid of all the semicolons. 58. F10. Expected one argument. Oh, yeah. All of these will now take one argument, which is regs. We'll mark regs as mute. Regs, regs, mute, mute. But yeah, I do think Rust could have the best performance properties for something like this due to the aliasing stuff. And then RCX, all these not found in the scope. Uh, regs dot this, regs dot this, regs dot RDX, regs dot RBX, regs not. Regs dot regs dot rdx regs 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 okay that should be buildable uh not quite memory um and we have no references except for inside of there okay and that builds. Okay, so what we should be able to do is memory uh, 128, and we'll do, uh, yeah, we can actually just dro drop some of these numbers down. Let's just say this is, uh, the pointer's at 16. We're going to copy 8 bytes from 16. So we'll go 16 to 16 plus 8. Uh, iter mute for each x is 41, right? So we'll print the memory before and after this. And now this just returns out, which is kind of interesting. Um, we'll print the memory, and then we'll print the memory here. I guess we probably want to do regs.memory in this case. And borrowed here after move. Oh, um... Uh, yes, because we do move it. Let regs is equal to this. There's our VM exit. Okay, so, and then we can trim this down to 32 bytes. So, before execution, we have the four ones here, and then after execution, the four ones get copied to here, right? Because we call memcopy with zero, address zero as the destination, rbx as the source, which is 16 bytes into it, and then we'll copy eight bytes. If we change this to copy one byte for me, please... We got 4-1. And if we copy 32 bytes, 
I guess we'll go out of bounds and we'll get a VM exit. Um, and we don't see the VM exit because we don't set that yet. Um, let's just have this print regs. Should be able to do that. Uh, drive debug. Uh, VM exit, VM exit, and then here we can do uh, enum VM exit none uh, access fault. Right. We're just we're not actually writing any code yet. We're just making some boilerplate examples of roughly what we want to model. When we enter the VM, we want to do uh, regs dot VM exit is VM exit none. And then in the case of a memory fault, we'll say regs.vmexit is vmexit access fault, I think is what I called it. So I'll copy that down to here. And here's roughly the code. And then down here, vmexit. Right, so before we enter, before we ever call into it, we set vmexit to none. And then in this case, we see we had an access fault. Uh, and we could store more information about what was accessed. We could say that uh, regs.racks was accessed. And in this case, we could see regs.rbx uh, is accessed. Change access fault to take a U64. And now we can see we had an access fault accessing hex 20, which is at the end of memory, right? So like this model is pretty clean, I would say. So let's see if we can get some zoomies out of here. Um, so we'll see. What are we going to say this is equivalent to in x86? Um, inc rbx, inc racks, um, and then this is a jump non-zero loop, right? So this is one, two, three, four, five, six instructions. Does anyone disagree with me? One, two, three, four, five, six x86 instructions per byte copied, right? Cons ins per byte is, we'll say, uh, six. So then we can change this to a much larger array. We'll say, let's copy 32 megs, and we'll copy from 16 megs, and we'll copy 16 megs, right? And this shouldn't access faults or anything. Um, obviously, that print's now going to suck. Um, we'll just print the VM exit code. So b before and after. Uh oh, overflowed stack. Huh. Oh, um, release. We have to do a release build for this. Okay. Oh, shit. Really? Really? Why did it emit different code? Why isn't... Why isn't emitting... Why isn't it emitting the same code? Uh, I mean, this might have just killed the idea. Um, oh, and let's do this. Turn on debug... Okay. F O O. Um. Okay. Wait, why is it allocating that much on the stack?
Am I doing something stupid? I'm really confused. It's not debug doing something stupid, is it? What? Like it feels, I mean, why is it allocating that much on the stack? Call inst foc. Why is it calling that? Is it because I can return out now? Is that why? I think it's because it needs a return path for all of the args through everything. I think since we return the registers like this, um, I think that's what it is. So let's not have it return anything because that seems to be hurting it. Um, we could try making regs a mutable reference, but so I could. <laughs> I can make VM exit work, right? I can implement my own like set jump long jump where I can have it just jump out to a function and then I can forcibly return code flow back to where it was. Like I can make an isolated execution context that the VM exit will cause me to like exit out of my fake environment, right? I can I can engineer that problem away. Um So let's try passing in registers, and then let's add the VM exit. Um, pub fn VM exit regs registers, panic VM exit regs dot VM exit. Okay, derive debug. So set that, call that. Well, basically never return, but we don't care. And then these will be VM exit, uh, VM exit regs. Okay, semis for everyone, VM exit regs. Okay, so now we can't return back to where we were, but we can make that work. We can, we can make that magic happen. Can't leak private type, registers pub. What? What? Well, then maybe I can return the registers out. Why is it? It calls that instruction. I don't get it. If I made this smaller. I agree with that. This this code gen is different. Oh, this just at compile time proves it can just call vm exit. It does. 
This just calls Veeam Exit and doesn't update any memory. But see, here's the thing though. It's not, it's, it's not an issue of, it's allocating on the stack that much memory, right? Why is it allocating it that much on the stack? That makes no sense to me. Right? Like, there's no reason it should be doing that when you use vex syntax. I'm, I'm so confused. Uh, push zero U8. Yeah, here it's not allocating shit on the stack anymore. Like, I don't understand what it's doing. I don't think it's allocating a big stack. Well, it was. Now I think it's doing recursion. But, okay, call reserve. That's populating everything. Move that into EDX. Then it calls VM exit. Right, it doesn't even call, uh, I guess here it calls the inst foo. Then that calls, it does recur. Why does this recurse? Why does this recurse? Uh, make main pub. So here's main. Call inst foo. Yep, and then it calls inst foo. But why isn't it tail call optimizing this? Um... Mark all of these pub. It lost its mojo. Okay. This is exactly what I was afraid of. Is it... Is it the... Is it the registers not directly as args? I think it's the, yeah, look, it's creating, it's creating the argument on the stack. Oh, fuck. So we're not going to be able to do this if we have more registers, I think. Okay, so I'm pretty sure if we make this uh, a reference, it'll be fine. But now we have memory accesses, which kind of sucks. Um, but...
Um. Is it because we're using a structure? But then would I just have the problem once I have enough, um, would I just have the problem again once I have enough arguments that it has to use stack again? But you should be able to pass six arguments on the stack. So I, I don't understand. Um... Okay. What was what if I made this a tuple struct? Uh whatever. Um Okay, so we'll change this to um Try something like this. I mean, this will this this should ultimately be identical. I don't know if it is, but it, it should be. Um. And make this pub. But I think this will do the same thing. In this case, it's not. But is this just simple enough? Our DX memory a mute u8 a. I'd be surprised if this was a difference, but um, it's doing some weird stuff, to be honest. Yeah, this is trying to make the structure. It's trying to create structures. Shit. Shit. Um... Mute racks. Uh, mute racks. Who says mute RBX? Who says mute uh, RCX? Who says mute RDX? Who says mute memory? Mute U eight. Uh, VM exit. VM exit. Mute. Is that correct? Um, okay, and we just bang all these in here. V makes it racks rbx rcx rdx memory. I bet we're gonna have issues when we have enough things being passed as arguments that it does stack accesses again. It's kind of what I suspect, but I think this will work. Uh, regs. This match types. Yeah, we're not doing U sixty fours anymore. 
Struct is not a zero cost abstraction. Yeah, apparently not. But we'll see. I mean, we don't know yet. Um. Uh, oh, um, we'll just call this the VM exit funk. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We're close. Just got to find this error. Pub type. Hey, okay. Nope. Wait. So this calls exit because But this jumps to FOC, right? This got rid of the calls, except for this call to exit, but that's acceptable. Then VM exit funk, and then that panics and exits. Um, I'm not too worried about the call to VM exit. That's not a big deal to me. That's not going to bother me. Um, VM isn't, VM exit isn't extern at all. Um, move EDI one, call that. I mean, I just, I don't care. I don't care about that call. I care about calls to function implementations. And this doesn't have it anymore. Mm, nope, this call is F10. Why? Okay, let's make this no return. RSI RCX and RCX are all the registers, aren't they? Yeah, the arguments are now on the stack. Um, okay, so this is not acceptable, um, because we have calls to F10, and that's because the argument's getting passed on the stack. You know where this goes next, right? I don't know how I'm going to do memory in this context. Uh, 
Don't try this at home, kids. Now the question is, will that be no alias for those variables? And I don't know because they're globals. They might be treated in a way that another thread could update them. But hopefully they don't. Trying my best. Trying my best. Okay. Ah, uh, static. Uh huh. Um. Ah, uh, unsafe. Damn it. This is effectively what my JIT already emits, right? What's the new alias flag? Or mute alias or something? Dash Z, no alias or something. Someone mentioned it earlier in chat. Dash Z. Equals one, do I have to set it? True. Ah. Uh, Do do do. Okay, it's just uh, unstable. Damn it. Um. Come on, Rust. It's because they're globals, right? So... Hmm. Is it doing calls, though? Yeah, it's still doing a call. So why did this work? Why did this work? Oops. Fuck, I refreshed it. I might have lost it. Okay, I lost whatever I changed. Um, guessing this is get unchecked mute. RBX is deal as U U8. RAX. So what changed, man? Is it just the one extra argument on the stack? Is that really all it was? Was the VM exit? Bink, 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 bink. Is this where it all just falls apart right here? Was it the fact that it was an enum? We're, we're really on the fringes here. Like, I could totally see if we wrote this 
it would end up breaking at some point just due to some weird uh due to some weird compiler change um yep out out There's the call. It literally was just the one extra parameter. Pushed it, pushed it over the edge. Oh, God. Um. And we had issues when we had registers be a structure. I think. Well, that's calling out out. Oh, technically, technically this isn't calling, this doesn't call any instructions. Yeah, it doesn't call any instructions here. Um... It's quite the tangent here, but man, if we could figure this out, it would be huge. Okay, let me change this to a Vmegs it. Do you think this breaks it? Oh, it's because it technically adds another arg here. And this last arg is probably the nail in the coffin because this has another arg for the uh, enum variant. Wait, there's still no calls to instruction. It only calls out out. What? Okay. What's different to this code? Well, that code's now really broken. You should be able to do this, right? Where I pass zero thirty-two thirty-two zero mute memory VM exit none. Okay, main, here we go. What? Why? Okay, what? What's different? Isn't this literally what we just did and we had calls? So, hmm, okay. This is effectively what we are building that had recursion problems. And all the calls are to out out. Which means this code will run. I, I, I swore we tried this. Here we go. Paste. We have no out out. Is it because out out is, ooh. Is it because out out is X turn?
No. Okay. Uh, FN out out panic. Maybe it's because I was printing beam exit. Let's try this. What? We are we are on some we are treading on some thin ice. Thin ass ice. Um Uh, and we can actually give this the code of what faulted. Make this a U64. Um, oh yeah, and that's 16 megs is the copy. Wait, one meg is the copy. Wait, why is that... Why is that faulting? Um, we make 32 megs, racks, RBX, RCX, RDX, memory. Print. This is uh, memory.len. Yup. Um, Let's make sure this logic is correct. If RBX is less than or equal to this, then read RBX, advance RBX, RBX, pass all the args in. In this situation, R, if Rax is less than that, read Rax, assign that, plus equals that. RCX minus equals this. Pass that through. If it's not equal to zero, go to foo. Otherwise, go to 10. Here at 10, we do this. Um... I'm confused. Why is that going out of bounds? RCX. Thanks, Geekbyte, for the Discord shout out. How does, how does this not work? I'm kind of confused. This would indicate, oh wait. No, that's RCX and that's RDX. VM exit, racks, RBX, RCX. We call foo, we go into here. If RBX is less than or equal to this, then exit with RBX. Uh, first, I'm going to see which one it's faulting. It's probably... No, it's faulting on the right. If Rax is less than or equal to memory minus 1, Rax plus equals 1, Rax, RBX, RCX, DL. RCX minus equals that. Why would Rax go out of bounds first? This is going to probably have a recursion problem, but uh, we might see a little bit first. Wait, what? Oh, uh, I have a copy pasta error. This is FO8. 
Okay, and then we probably have the recursion issue again, because that was just incorrect. This goes to 4, this goes to 8, this goes to C, this goes to 0 or 10. Okay, no longer crashing. Okay, uh, but I think this is going to crash now. No, it doesn't. This has no calls. This is a 16 meg mem copy. And if I did a, if I made this 32 megs, so this just fits, right? So this just fits in memory. If I made this 16 plus one, this will have an access fault and let's have a read fault and a write fault. Um, read fault and write fault. Now we know why it faulted. So we had a read fault out of bounds. Yep, because we want one byte out of bounds. So this works. This is doing the mem copy. Um, and is this getting optimized out, maybe? I mean, I guess I don't care if it is or not. Well, I kind of do. Um... Well, I guess this has to go to panic, which then prints this information. So the question is, is this actually doing the mem copy? And I think it has to. Let's allocate a meg and have it do 512. And this one, we should feel that it gets slower. Oh, yeah, that's definitely running. The first print is just the allocation, which we can now make into this. Uh, vec OU8 a gig. So allocate a gig. And given it takes a little bit of time, let's go to four gigs now. Yeah, that's running. That's running. So, this is pretty fucking good. This is pretty fucking good. Like, I don't know what my JIT would output, but I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be able to copy two gigs in that much time. Right, that's doing, that's basically copying at, I mean, that's basically full speed, I think. Um, Rustjet main. Let's see what it does. Inst F10. Ooh, there's a call to F10. Did it optimize it? Is this the copy? Or is that zeroing it? As long as it doesn't do the looping call, it should be fine. Well, the thing is, this would now probably turn in... Eventually, when this gets put into something, this probably becomes a, a looping call. Right? I don't know. I just think once things start getting too large, it'll start turning into calls. Um, I mean, it LVM shouldn't have to look that far out because it knows that it's just a tail call. But if it does the tail call optimization after inlining has occurred, that could be an issue. Now I could maybe say everything's inline never. And basically you can never inline these things and maybe it will just turn into um This might make it actually easier for it to do tail call optimization. It's going to hurt perf. 
by quite a bit. Um, but it might make it feasible. So this will now call into foo. But this is probably no longer going to call anything because it only has to optimize within the function. Um, and I think the problem would be if it ends up trying to do TCO on something that got inlined and thus it's not doing tail call optimization on a simple case anymore. It's doing it on a very sophisticated, uh, like all these things get merged into one function and then it tries to see if it can tail call that. Uh, where if it did the tail call first, if it just turned everything into tail calls and then did optimization passes, it should never fail. Like the odds that this would fail are minuscule. Now the question is, this had the one call um, to an inst. And was this just intentional? Like, is this just fine? And is this the actual copy? Did we get optimized again? I think it is. I think it got, like, very optimized. Um... The thing is, this F10 is kind of the end, and so it just might be putting a call there because it just doesn't see a need to tail call optimize it, or we could be seeing a glimpse of the end of the tunnel where it ends up not working past this stage. So given it's just about to go to this to panic, it's hard to say. Like... Is this an actual call because it would emit a call here if you were to wrap this in another thing? Or is this a call just because it's the end and it's just... I mean, I don't know why it wouldn't inline this, to be honest. If we mark it inline, that shouldn't make a difference if they're in the same compile unit. Um, yeah, it's still the same. It'll make no difference. Could make a loop that mem copies back and forth. I really just need like a more complex example, I think. And the question is, should I just start writing the Risk Five emulator that generates this code, or, um, because there's like a, I feel like there's like a ninety plus percent chance that we write it and it just doesn't work. I don't know, man. What are you planning to do with Fuzz Week? We're going to mainly do um, some optimization stuff on uh, the JIT and look into um, kind of the code that's being hit. And we might hop back to that, but I don't know. This is really tempting. Any reason why you're using at t syntax? It's just default. I just didn't pass the flag. Um... I don't know, man. I think this is just sort of one of those things you just kind of have to do, and you have to see if it works or not. What I think would work, I think hands down, what would work is if I marked everything no inline to make tail call optimization easier on the compiler, and then I did blocks and I emit the block at foo. So until I get to the first like indirect branch, I just am emitting code for this. Because inside of a function will never make a call. So I could just go and I could lift every instruction until I hit a um an unconditional branch or uh, not an unconditional branch, an indirect branch, so like a ret um and just chug and churn out the code for everything. But I think that might actually make it harder because some of the calls, like a call to us would just be setting RA and then jumping to another instruction. But if I did blocks, there would actually be an exit point in the middle of the function where here there's only exit points at the end. There's only one exit 
kind of to, to these uh, things. I don't know, man. Like, this is scary. Is this just because it's the end? It puts a UD2 after it, so it knows it's no return. It promotes the no return of panic to this up to the other one. Wait, does it have to do that? Does this... Hmm. Okay. Here's a crazy idea. Does it have to call instaf 10 because this panics and that needs to establish the unwind chain? Is it because of unwinding from the panic and this path needs to be clear? Thoughts? It's a little bit smarter about it now, but... What if I didn't have this panic? What if I had this uh, unsafe asm int3 uh, feature asm? Let's see if this one can get optimized. I bet it's due to the unwinding. Yeah, there's no inst f10 anymore. Um... I, it's it's something to do with the panic. Yeah, here it just calls. Well, here it calls out out still. It's kind of interesting. Oh, we have that inline never. I don't know why I had that inline never, but and here there's the int three. It's all the way up to the top. There's no calls anymore. None. There are no occurrences of a call inst. I mean, this is really good performance here. This is, this is I think, the code that's getting generated. Let's put it in a readable syntax. Um, and before we do this, before we run the code, I'm going to do this. That's just an indicator. That's like code starts here. Indicator. Nop, nop, nop. Okay. So this is the start of the code. Yeah, it vectorized it. Like, you, you, you can't really beat that. Now, maybe that's because these are constants, and it can reason about it better, but like... I mean, this literally turned a byte, byte by byte copy into a multi byte copy. Can you tell it to use Skylake? Um, uh, target CPU is native. Oh boy, is that faster? Yeah, now it's using YMMs, right? It's not using XMMs, but it'll use YMMs. Um, it's not really going to make it faster, but it kind of proves the concept. So the question is, if I have this just int3, I can, I can perform unwinding myself. I can call into inst foo manually. I can literally set up a stack. I can set up a new stack that's not in use and I can jump into this and I can, when I get to the end, I can restore the old stack, right? I can make my own calling convention or complex thing there to make that whole path work. Um, I wonder if having panic here was the problem and that's why we 
gave up on on one of these approaches. Um, that one sucks. The one with globals is ass. I think we can all agree with that. Let's try the one with the structures again. That's the one I'm most interested in. Because I think this is the cleanest. Um, but we don't want mute registers. We just want registers. Okay. So I think this was in a state that worked. It is. And this has call issues. Yeah, this calls inst foo. Um, this one is setting up stack stuff to pass things on the stack, which is kind of interesting. Um, so this might not work. Okay. I'm going to get rid of the panic. That calls FOC, and FOC is a loop, so that is not acceptable. Huh. Yeah, so this one doesn't work. Unsave asm int three. Let's just go and get that working. Just to see. I don't think this will change anything. No, it looks the same. Um, okay, so that leaves kind of one final thing to try, which is fill up the register bank with more registers, right? Um... We just kind of have to do it. So let's let's start generating code, kind of. Uh, code gen dot, uh, VSP code gen dot pi. We're just going to do this so that I can do a format string with the argument shape. So we can see args is equal to this. And then we have um, our pass is vm exit racks rbx rcx rdx memory. Okay, and then here you can make that an f string. Fuck. Um, let's not make that a format string, because otherwise we can't use curly braces. We're just going to say this is, um, you know, we can just edit this in the Rust file. Oops. Uh, sp source main. Ah. Up here, we're going to move source main to template.rs, and then here we'll edit template.rs, and then we can... We'll just do a string replacement. Um, funk args. Okay, unsafe fn funk args. Funk args. Same thing here. And then we'll stop editing this in this way. Um, and then we can make accessors for registers and stuff that we can template in so we can play around with structures versus references and all that stuff. We just need to get a lot of this stuff more templated out so we can uh, kind of rapidly prototype some of these designs. Um, funk args. Okay. 
And then... So out, out, takes funk args, funk args, and then this takes a arg pass. I just thought Gamoso was Asian American? Nope. He was born old white boy here. Uh, how many registers could he possibly have in the bank? Yeah, that's what we're going to try. That's why we're doing this, so we can just spew a shit ton of registers into here. I don't know. I feel like this is going to fall apart. Especially when he has some indirect jumps or something. There's no reason it should, right? But it probably will. Python 3 code gen.py. Okay, um, template is uh, open template rs um, dot read template dot replace funk args with args. I can't remember how this works. I don't remember if it does it in place or not, but let's just assume it doesn't. Um, arg pass with arg pass. This is not perfect yet. And then open source main dot rs dot write main dot rs. Oops, write template. Also system cargo run release. Uh, import os. Oh, right my uh right. DL not found in the scope. Perfect. That's true. We change this to RDX. Uh make these mutable bindings. Okay. And then we might have to get rid of this temporarily. Otherwise we need one without the mutes, I think. Um mute 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 memory does not need to be mute okay so this that works okay rb uh rsi rdi rbp um r sp r8 R9, 10, and we could technically derive this next one from that first one, but uh, I'm not going to write that yet. Okay, thoughts? Supplied six arguments down here. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Something like that. It's like close. Supplied 19. There we go. Oh, shit. Shit. <laughs> Okay, let's try something, um, pub extern fn entry, uh, inline never, funk args, and then this will be an inst, basically I want to shatter the, um, ability for the compiler to inline this and thus optimize, since we're passing in constant args, I want to see what happens when it's unable to reason about that and it has to assume they're dynamic and making this thunk should do the trick. Um, because this is inline never, this also is extern, so it's required that this is entryable uh, from any location, which means it can't make assumptions about the arguments. This is where it might fall apart, but this is more realistic. Um, uh, pub uh, unsafe external fn? 
next turn unsafe. Okay, that works. Um, which means that let's take a look at main now. So main should have a call to entry, and it does. And what does it do? It passes. I don't know. It probably made a or something on the stack or something. So then entry. This entry. Um. Yeah, who knows what the fuck this is doing? Oh, this inlined everything. But it. Hmm. How did it make that? How did it do this? How did it put two gigs in here? Um, is it because it's a binary? Is that why? Because it's a binary? Move this to lib.rs? Because uh, binary can't have extern symbols or something? Perfect. Test. It shouldn't be able to optimize th this test code. It should export all of these things now. Um, test release. Uh, go clean. I don't know where it emits the file for that. Not FFI safe. Yep, don't care. Target release. Um, where does this go? Where does it put this shit? Target release depths. This is the binary. Um, so this is a call once. Yep, that makes sense. And that calls this entry. This is just not true, though. Shit. I want this to not get optimized to where it has this as a constant. Because I'm concerned that it's not fair right now. Use test black box on args. Um, you could try it. You give it a closure, right? Oh, you just wrap it around things. Um, uh, there's not a great way for me to do that. Um, let RCX is test black box RCX. We only have to omit the ones that we, uh, zero, one, and two. So racks, RBX, and RCX. And where do I get test from? It's still, yeah, it's still assuming, it still consprops those. 
damn it. Damn it. Oh, fuck. Maybe I black box the other side. Still working. Nope. That's still getting optimized through. Okay. Um. Oh, shouldn't the hash change? Yeah, it probably did. No, it didn't. So sometimes it doesn't. I, I don't understand quite how the hash works, but it's a little bit more complex. Um. Okay, let's try this. This. Try this. Oh shit, that did it. I think. I think that did it. Um. So these are the only args it uses, and they're all black boxes now. This is jumping to JIT entry, and nothing in here, nothing in here is assuming anything. Subtract one from R8, compare with RSI, that's the bounce check. Int three, if we have, uh, if we have a, a, an access violation, pop racks and ret, not that that'll ever happen. Here we have the JIT entry, this, so this is, here's what it's doing. Um, this is push racks, just an argument. Um, subtract one from R8. That is this. Then we're comparing RBX, which is the first or second argument, against R8. If it's above or equal to, it's out of bounds. Then we check the bounds of this. We actually check the other argument as well in the same pass. Then... We get to here if everything's successful. We read one byte from RCX plus RSI, and then we store that one byte to RCX plus RDI. We add one to RDX, which is now advancing the... I don't know what RDX is advancing in this case. doesn't really matter. That jumps to uh, 6F. So then we jump... Oh, if it's equal, RDX... We subtract one from RDX. Oh, oh, RDX in this case is going to be the, the loop counter. Then, if it's equal to zero, then it goes to 6F, which is the ret. That is, we're done with the loop. Otherwise, we will increment the pointers both by one. We'll not to align. We'll compare R8 and RSI. If we are below, so this is now doing the bounce check again. Um, checking the boundaries on them, doing the load. So this is the core loop, and then this will jump to 50. So this is the core loop now. So the first one's a little weird because it's doing the first bounce checks and loading some boundaries in memory. Then this is the loop. This is the code that we generate. Check the bounds of the source and dest. Load the source into here. Store the dest into here. Increment the source and dest. Decrement the count. Loop forever. This is like... It's not vectorized or unrolled to use dword accesses but this is about as clean as you can get uh if i were to write a jit that preserved the naive semantics like didn't promote a one byte read to a four byte read and it preserved the semantics this is about as optimized as you can possibly get um it would it would take me probably a month to write a jit that could take in this code and produce a loop this tight and this clean
so I don't know. We, we it's now this is now no longer assuming anything about the state of the code, and we have no calls. Is it time? Do we just do this? We have a fuck ton of arguments that we pass in. Now, does it not pass those arguments because we don't realize them uh, at the end? Where are all the arguments? Actually, memory. Oh, did it reorder the arguments to these functions? And I bet it did. I bet it reordered it to put memory out front, which is great. That's actually something I would like to have. But I think what I'll do is I'll mark out out as uh, extern C FN. That makes sure they come in, in the, that order. So at the end, it will convert them back. So, or out out. Uh, int three. Uh, is it smart enough to realize I don't need the arguments here? I don't think it is. Um, what? Oh, there's no main, is there? Uh, this is test. Or something. I guess we care about uh, entry. Um, yeah, it knows it doesn't need the args, so the thing is no one's used all of the arguments yet. Um, okay. Print, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, we can make a tuple. Arg pass. Come on. Doesn't implement debug. Oh yeah, um... I see. Arg pass. Really? That doesn't implement debug? What doesn't implement debug here? VM exit does. We can just do this. Um. Uh, X is this. This should complain that it's not in use. Move racks X. And I guess this will be a reference to it. Come on. There it is. There's all the args. It stores them on the stack, and then here's our int three, and then we get a pointer, right? So we have racks is is the um, it's a pointer to all of the all of the fields. So this is where they all came from. It knows that these are all zeros, I think, because of the black box. Um. Shit. Will this work? Or is this just not complex enough of an example? Is it time to try? Time to try it? What's our what's our loss if it doesn't work? It's not too bad. Um, because this is pretty impressive, right? Like, 
It's a little bit slower than when we only had a couple args or didn't have the black box, but we're copying 2 gigs in 2.7 seconds. My current JIT would be probably 5 or 6 times slower than this. Um, don't you, Okay, I gotta catch up on chat. I'm sorry. I neglect you guys sometimes. Um, let's see. Uh, in case you follow the risk v fastest fuzzer for Gamosa, is there a difference in the aspect or implementation between this one and that one? Uh, that one was done correctly. This one is just kind of hacky and a and a and an example. If we get it working with Rust, this will actually be a very very good um, emulator. Um, let's see, how exhaustive is? Is it to emulate X664? It's not too bad. It's like a week. About a week of work. Uh, what he's working on right now is not a full fuzzer. It'll be a replacement for the existing JIT system within the emulator core for the fuzzer he's built. Yeah. Yeah, so the previous few days we wrote an emulator, and then we made a JIT for the emulator that's really shitty. And then we're now trying to find if this idea that I had like a couple months ago would actually work for an emulator, because if it could... This would produce a really, really fast uh, emulator. Um, but yeah, we're mainly just trying to see if this is viable, and I have no idea if it is. I have roughly 10k channel points on your Twitch. Don't know how to use them. Yeah, I I actually don't know what the fuck they're useful for. Um. Okay, so let's see what we can do here. Um, we just gotta see if this shit works. And I think to see if this shit works, we just have to do it. And to just do it will cost us. Hub. Do I make some bold claims here? You guys want some bold claims? I think one uh, one hour. I think we can have a test working in one hour. Thoughts? Anyone want to call bullshit? It's not going to work, but we're going to see if it compiles. I think. You guys are so needy. Um, emu dot test jit, uh, base of the executable section, size of the executable section. Okay. Whew, I'm already sweating. I'm pre-sweating here. Cargo run. Okay. And then, uh, test jit. Yeah, this won't build. Perfect. So then here we're going to make a new function called uh, test jit. Takes a self start, which is a u size, end is a u size, and we're just we're just hacking. Okay, we can rewrite this entire thing. We can rewrite this entire thing if it does work, and if it doesn't work, we're going to spend minimal time fucking up, um, and we're going to fix some of these uh, bugs quick. This is just uh, debug stuff, so we'll just get rid of that. Get rid of some of these warnings and errors. Psych is equal to something. Here, not used. End case RNG. Uh, hmm. Uh, Prints. Just get this to shut up. RNG.rand. Thanks. Okay, start end not used, end case is 629 uh, underscore this. Yeah, I don't always use it, but there we go. Much better. Okay, so then what we're going to do is for adder, oops, 
four adder in start to end step by four uh, asserts start and three is zero and assert end and three is zero it, it doesn't really matter okay so that's going to go through every four byte region in executable code um I would not suggest jumping into a significant binary for testing. Yeah, we're just gonna YOLO it. We're gonna see. We can we can make a test thing, but uh, basically, I want to make sure it produces valid Rust. Um, I don't really care if it runs or not or has the stack exhaustion. I just want to produce valid Rust. And then once we have valid Rust being produced, then we can worry about finding a smaller application or actually testing it. Uh, bah, 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 bah. What is this? Uh, bank project is definitely outdated. <laughs> I should, uh, yeah, let's try this. Let's go Streamlabs, CloudBot, Commands, Projects, Edits. Today we're working on more uh, fuzz, fuzzing with emulators. Uh, we're currently exploring, uh, potential, uh, JIT replacement candidates to get better performance, and if it, pan uh, after that we'll be focusing on, uh, viewing the results of the, uh, fuzzer uh, main, uh, mainly graphing the coverage and uh, viewing where we're hitting code in the test program. Okay, there we go. Um, let's see, what else? Timer's ticking. Fuck, did someone start a timer? Shit! Well, then I can't read chat as much. Uh, highlight every message. Hell yeah. Bold claims. Spam the chat with highlighted messages. Um, what is this? Currently, we're working on a RISC-V emulator, and we're doing an experiment right now. We're, we're doing something that's very likely going to fail. What language do we program in? We're using Rust here. Uh, we use a mix of Rust and assembly. No idea how Brandon learned all this stuff. Probably personal research for years. Yeah, about... About... Probably, probably like... 20, 25, or 30 years of, of programming and research. I haven't been alive that long, but I'm just assuming research is typically 40 hours a week, and I've say I've probably averaged 70 or 80 for the past like 15 years. So I've got like what a comparable person has in probably 25 or 30 years of experience, <laughs> and I'm and I'm 20. Twenty-seven. I think I'm twenty-seven. <laughs> hey, dude, how's it going? All right, we gotta get this shit going because some fucker started a timer. It's actually kind of why I was hyping it up. I wanted a timer started because it it makes it more intense. Yeah. Okay. Read the instruction. Uh, this is at adder. Yeah, we'll call it PC. So go through every executable PC in the program. And we'll print the PC. And we'll print the instruction. And these should be O10s. Aww. Uh, results. VM exits. And then test jits on wrap air vm exit exit that way it won't continue execution. So we'll print a bunch of numbers. It'll print a bu print a bunch of numbers. Ah shit! What's it doing? 
Oh, that's the wrong one. This one. Um, 1,000. And then this is 2A9FD8. Is the size of the text section. Here we go. Yep, so it's printing. It's going through every single thing in the program, and it is printing the... Uh, instruction. So then we're going to make a function for all those. Uh, how many is this? So we'll have uh, 680,000 functions in this test program. Uh, that might be hot. That might be hot. Um, const args is um do 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 Oh yeah. Um. Hmm. Hmm. Stir. And this will be equal to a. Uh, let mute args is string new for i i in. 0 to 33, register from ii, I think I implemented that, I'm pretty sure I implemented that, I did, um, print args plus equals ref format register name lower. Um, to lower, is it on the string? How do I do, how do I, uh, lower, lower. To lowercase. Um... From because we have PC now. Uh, okay, and then head, and this should just be a list of all the registers. Oh, we don't print it. Uh, print args. So now we should have all the arguments. Nice. The zero register will never actually use. Honestly, maybe I won't even provide a zero register. I think I'll make sure register that is not mute. So these are this is like the arg pass. So this is if we want to pass the arguments to a function. Um, args is r. Uh, can I have a trailing comma in a function call? I don't think so. Bink. Okay. Arg call. And then arg, args, and this is going to be mute blah colon u64. Okay, and then this is uh, arg call, and this is args. So then args should be these bad boys. And then let's just get rid of the trailing thing. Can you pop from a string? Otherwise, I can just slice it by the length minus one. But pop would be kind of nice. Pop. Removes the last character. God damn right. Okay. So this is the argument structure. Oh, there's one more. Pop, pop. Now, this should be all the arguments that will be 
function arguments. Okay, and then we have all of the arguments for when we do a call, and then we need to add arg call plus equals memory and vm exits. Now we can just do that. Okay, memory will be a mutable reference to bytes, and vm exit will be a vm exit. Uh, oops, args. Okay. There we go. Memory and vm exit. Okay, so then we should be able to uh, create the function. So this will be um, let mute code is string new. And then we'll do code plus equals format uh, pub unsafe fn mm, we can be more we can be better about where we put our unsafes maybe yeah we'll just no we'll figure it out um inst underscore o10x uh o18x in this case and then we pass in the args. So we have the, and then a curly brace, new line. So we'll have PC, and then we'll have the args. And then code plus equals uh, one of these bad boys. And this is a double. And then standard FS writes code.rs, code, unwrap. Y'all see where this is going, right? <laughs> there we go. It's only a million lines of rust. It's not too bad. Um. Oh, uh, let's put underscores on everything such that we won't have any complaints about them not being used. I don't know if we'll still get mute complaints on it. So the question is, will Russ complain about the mute in this case, since I have underscores? But we'll just access them all with underscores so we don't get as many uh, warnings. Come on, it's not that much code. I actually expected this to be basically instant. It's just tokenizing it. It's not doing anything. It's not producing code. How long is this going to take? I, I'm actually curious. Um, how many lines of code? It's not that many. It's like a million. Yeah, 1.3 million. I actually have no idea why it's taking so long. I mean, this might make it infeasible as is. I expected this to take like a second at most. Go check your memory stats. Ah, mm. uh, wrong machine. Um, yeah, 
it's using eight gigs. Not a big deal. Why is it taking so long? It's compiling, but uh, the function bodies are all empty. And it can't... It can't produce a binary right now, because it doesn't have a main. I don't know. I haven't really had compile time issues with Rust. The compile time issues are people who pull in a bunch of libraries and you have 800 dependencies for your program, and that's on you. That's your fault. But compile times are pretty fast. I mean, we could also just make this produce C code. We don't have to have it generate Rust. It doesn't really matter. Is it stuck before or after LVM? I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm really surprised it's taking this long. What the fuck? Like, what is it actually doing? The fuck? Okay, so I have some ideas. Um, first of all, we can cut some of this down a little bit. Let's just, for testing, we'll cut this to end uh, start plus A192. All right, so now it's much smaller. What? Oh, that's the old one. Uh, geez. I wonder if it's accumulating the errors or something that it's unhappy about. Uh, so VM exit will turn into a U64. I wonder if it's like accumulating the errors or something that's kind of giving it some uh, fuss. What? I will consider adding a main function. Uh, I can just say um, create type static lib. That took a second? It's 4,000 lines of code. What? Why? Um Yeah, all the code just gets deleted, I think. Wait. Uh, oh, pub extern. Do I need to mark it extern? I don't think so. I feel like it doesn't need to be extern. Where the fuck are the instructions? Like, where's the code? How is that getting optimized out if it's pub extern? Maybe it refuses because it's an empty symbol? <sighs> Or an empty function? That makes no sense, though, because what what if I need to call it? I don't know if it's an empty function. Oh, 
Oh, uh, is it just debug info? Is that the problem? That's probably what it is. What the fuck? What if I don't optimize? How's it removing those? What? What? They wouldn't get that mangled. Unless they all redirect. Maybe they redirect via imports to thunks. Let's uh let's just hack this temporarily. Let's just have it take a PC again. Now it returns a unique value. Oops. Shit, maybe these build times are just going to be that slow. Where the fuck are the functions? What? I don't get it at all. That makes no sense. I think I can have it build an object. Commit obj. Um There we go. There's inst. That's not optimized. So static lib, for some reason, things get optimized out, but not in lib? Okay, well that makes sense. That's what I was kind of expecting to see. Okay. Um... Huh. What other trait types are there? Trait type bin lib r lib die lib. I'm just trying to find the fastest one. Okay. How much time does it save? or hurt to do directly. So directly emitting the object kind of helps. But I like having the SO. And here's all our instructions. Okay, cool. So, that's seriously gonna take three seconds for just that? How? 
Oh! Why would this take 3.6 seconds? What is it possibly doing? That's ridiculous to me. Ah, uh, perf. Perf. Yeah, let's try cargo check. That's a good, uh, what does cargo check do, actually? How do I do check? You can rusty Z perf, yeah. Um, time. Code gen. So parsing is pretty, f uh, parsing the crate, expanding the crate. Lowering. Yeah, like everything's basically instant, which is what I would expect. And then code gen stuff happens. Um, okay. I mean, it is 360 megs of code, which is a decent amount, but it's nothing crazy. How long would it take to regex 360 megs? A second? Is this just infeasible? We could maybe produce C. So there it's done parsing. AST validation. Like, that's not incredibly bad. That's pretty bad, but nothing insane. Create injection. Expand crate. Create a macro, okay? Gated feature checking. Configure and expand. I don't know what that does. Her lowering, this should take about half the time, so it should take like 15 seconds. Okay, 30 seconds on that. What's our next slowdown? These are each... Yeah, these are each about 30 seconds. Drive. Misc checking. Okay, good, good. Glad we passed that. Hmm. 
Uh, I guess you want to figure out the growth order. It's like 4K functions. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. That's, that's kind of what I'm trying to see right now because I have the old results. And we can see... Where does it get really slow? Basically, I think these are all about 30 seconds. So the multiplier here is like 30 divided by 0.12, uh, which is 250. And what's 4,000 times 250? About a million. I think it's, I think it's pretty much linear. Um... To be honest, I actually don't know if it will be much slower once I add code. Because <laughs> it's not like we're adding that much code to these functions. Linking is the slowest? I don't know if it will be the slowest. Uh, Miss checking two, so that means we're like 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 60 seconds. So we're like a minute away. We're a minute away from getting to like the deeper code gen. And then this will allegedly, this will take 2.331 uh, times 250. Hopefully it's not linear on that, but that will take 10 minutes there. I'm hoping that some of these won't have the same scaling properties and some of them might just benefit or might be a little bit more linear. Like some of them might be a more flat cost. So like a base plus a different scaler. Lint checking. So I do have an idea. You guys are going to like this idea. But once this is done, I have an idea to speed this up a lot. Root collections. The next few should be fast, and then we'll have code, code gen to LVM IR. Now, LVM might be a little bit faster. Like, maybe Rust is a lot slower at the way that it's doing stuff than LVM, uh, CGU reuse. Okay, we're now doing code gen. So according to the 0 0.189 times the 250, this should take about 50 seconds. Um, and we'll see, hopefully it's not N squared or something. <laughs> this is a bit much. This is a relatively large binary, I would say. A 3 meg binary. So this is a pretty extreme case. Like, yeah, you're not going to be able to use this for Chrome. But a 3 meg binary and uh, the header size is this. Like, that's a fuck ton of code, right? It's 2.8 megs of code, which is ridiculous. Ridiculous. Um, code gen, 101 seconds. So that should be code gen done. Free global context. And then join worker thread, finish ongoing code gen. This is where it gets really long. We could also make this more JIT-like, where we could compile Rust functions to blocks. So we lift a block, generate the Rust in a block, and then compile that. And then we optimize in a block, but we don't get graph-level optimization. That would work as well. It's harder to like link in and use the resultant executable, because you kind of have to make sure there's no data section on it. But that actually shouldn't... 
Hmm. I don't know how tough that would be. Can the compilation be parallelized? That, see, that's what I'm hoping. Okay, let's try it. I mean, it's now up to 50 gigs. Not bad. Okay, so we're going to do this. Mod inst pound 018x. And then just put another thing here. Put another curly here and another PC out front. Now we put them in different modules. So now all of them are in different modules. This is a monster test case for thin LTO. <laughs> so hopefully this parallelizes after the initial um, tokenization. So once this parsing is done, it'll still probably take 40 seconds. But then it should be able to recognize they are modules, and if I'm not mistaken, modules are parallelized in Rust. Linking will be a bitch. Here we go. Come on, use some cores, damn it! Oh, is it not parallel by default? Uh, see help. There's like jobs or something. Code gen units. Divide create into n units to optimize in parallel. That's to optimize in parallel. I don't, I don't parse. Um. Let's see. Is there anything else here? Incremental. Don't vectorize loops, op level, overflow checks, prefer dynamic. Hundred ninety two code gen units. What else we got here? Threads. Use a thread pool with Yeah, bring it. Let me see you use some threads. What else we got here? Um, default units is 16 for non-incremental. Yeah. I think by putting them in mod modules, they should be able to parallelize this. Uh, probably in the code gen stages, not in the early stages, but in the code gen stages. Basically, it has to, like, split everything up first. And we'll see if we got any speed ups here. Create injection. See some threads. Come on. AST validation. What does it do after that? Get it feature checking. Configure and expand is probably where we are right now. Then some lowering. I don't know, we can generate C. It doesn't matter too much. C would probably be much faster here. We're not really using any of the safety features of Rust. So it doesn't matter anyways. We'd, we're, we, we would just be writing it unsafe. So let's see... Um. What GCC says. Oh, yeah. Mm. Uh, 
I mean, it's just probably bottlenecking on printing the terminal there, I think. So let's let's just start off with something basic. Uh, we won't pass args yet. Void inst this void no args. PC PC just PC. And code.c. Uh, just one of these. We'll see what C can do here. Um, well, I'll be damned. How? How does it possibly take this long? Holy shit, it's... <laughs> what the fuck? Oh my god! My plans have been foiled. This is kind of ridiculous. This is ridiculous. I'm actually really surprised. I'm really surprised. How long did that take? We didn't time it. I mean, we still haven't seen Rust complete, so, I mean, it's something. Let's see if it's a little bit faster when we're not linking it as a, a binary. Huh. How is it so slow? It's ridiculous. Does it count for the timer? I guess I guess so. What the fuck? Sixty seconds, that's not terrible. That's not terrible. Now let's see what happens when we make some arguments. Uh let's say unsend long. Uh, wait. Unsign long this. This one, these are just the args. And then memory uh, is a uh, what do we want memory to be? Uh, this needs to be an on-ten long as well. Then we have... Just a... Unsigned char star memory. And then... 
size T memory len. The memory length we'd probably hard code. All right, how much worse is this going to be? Is this going to be 56 seconds where it doesn't increase the cost? Or is it going to be much worse? Let's make sure everything's looking good here. Oh, what do you mean unknown type size T? Fuck you. On sign along. Tyler DNA, thank you so much for the tier one. Here we go. Will this be 50 seconds? Will this be significantly slower because we now have more tokens and more shit to parse? Even Vim is choking on your files? Not much, though. Vim isn't happy about them, but, you know, it's doing okay. I'm proud of it. It's doing a good job. Now, Clang, on the other hand, I'm not as impressed. I could try to split them up more and put them in different files or put group them into different files. Yeah. That puts more load on LTO, but that's fine. I mean, LTO is going to take a long time anyways, but at least we paralyze some part of the build process. And honestly, I don't even care if LTO chokes, right? I don't even need to use LTO. I just want to get, like, a decent amount of code grouped together. That's all I want. I don't really care if I get optimizations across every instruction boundary. I would just like it to happen across most. So, yeah, if a function ends up being split between two files and it does a, a jump to the next instruction instead of, a, um, instead of inlining it, not a big deal, because it won't happen on enough boundaries. Is this taking significantly longer? It's been a minute already, hasn't it? Has Jonathan bloated tested generated code in his Jai compiler? Huh. I'm not familiar at all with that. Create a thousand files with a thousand functions. Yeah. And the, like, I'll be creating the files in order, so instructions next to each other will likely be in the same file. And if they're jumping between them, it's not that much more expensive than what I'm doing. I mean, it'll still be cheaper and better than what I'm doing now. If there is any inlining and any use of a register scheduler, it's better than what I'm doing now. Did I hear dry race squeak? Yeah, I was just playing with, fiddling with my, my pencil. <laughs> I need to oil it. Not C, but a low level language. Spoken about it quite a bit. Is optimized sub-second compile times for projects on the order of 100,000 lines. Holy shit, nice. What kind of pencil needs to be oiled? It's just the, the casing, the metal casing. Jeez. Apparently arguments just just really make, uh, make this complex. God damn it. I just want an optimizing assembler. I want, I want an assembler with... Um, I want an assembler with uh, um, load store optimization. <laughs> Shouldn't that be possible with LVM? 
I think you'll find that LLVM has uh, approximately the exact same uh, time problems as this. Like, if the other one was able to tokenize, and if Rust was able to tokenize in 60 seconds, do you really think we're bottlenecking on tokenization right now? <laughs> we're bottlenecking on LLVM right now. <laughs> Yeah. We've been in LVM this whole time, right? We're not... <laughs> this problem is not solved by LVM. It's literally generating instructions. I don't know how it's so fucking slow. This is why I hate using third-party code, because it just always sucks. Like, my other JIT, my vectorized emulation stuff could do, could do a whole program like this. It would take, I don't know, 30 seconds? Yeah, at least they didn't put C to shame. Yeah, let's say, let's try GCC. I think GCC would likely be faster than LVM. LVM is definitely not optimized to be zoomy. We can also split it up into different compile units and stuff. And we've got we've got we've got options. Otherwise we can make our JIT better, which we can do. We can't really get rid of the re the register reads and writes, which kind of sucks. We could potentially output functions to C as long as they have no data section. Come on, GCC. I have faith in GCC. You got this. Straight up to Stallman. Bless up. Stallman, right now as we speak, is sending the data to my computer, compiling it by hand, writing it down, scanning it, doing some uh, OCR on the scanned paper, sending it over to uh, my computer right now as we speak. Ensuring that it's GPL. Oh, yeah. Yep. In fact, every single thing on the way. So he's trying to send me a document right now. And before he sends me the document, he's going to every ISP and every person that's involved along the way and making sure that all of the routers that are going to route this traffic are GPL only code. Um, one person said that their router's running FreeBSD and that person has been killed. Um, that code has since been rebranded with the GPL license. What is the perf util? It's just perf top. It just, it just shows you, uh, the CPU time for all of the different functions. It's <laughs> 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 I'd like to interject for a moment. What you're referring to as fuzz with emus is actually G and U fuzz with emus. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. I did once shake hands with someone who ran GPL code, and that's it. I can only write GPL code from this point on. <laughs> God forbid someone tries to monetize their code so they can maintain it. Holy shit! GCC, baby! Three minutes! <laughs> Woo! That is the first compiler who's made it through! GCC! You're my hero! Good job. Good job, GCC. So proud of you. Check TCC. If I can't install it with command line, it's not going to happen. TCC. 
I'm guessing it takes the C flag. Yeah. Woo! 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 Damn, girl! <laughs> TCC, what she got cooking? <laughs> See that that is what I would have expected out of GCC. Let's just run that again. How good is the generated code? I mean, hopefully it's just a ret. Um Does TCC have any level of optimization? TCC is it dash big big O big big O go fast? Ooh, run compiled source, fancy. Ooh, bench. Yeah. Bring it. It's not using it's not using threads, is it? It's not even using threads. Five seconds. Ninety-four megs a second. Two hundred and seventy thousand lines a second. <laughs> um built in built in memory and balance checker. Where's the optimization flag? Where's the zoomy flag? Dash O? It doesn't say. I don't see a dash O option. No. No. No, that just didn't do anything. That just didn't do anything. It's just not optimizing it, right? Yeah, it's not optimizing it. Okay, what's the what's the Oh, there's no Zoomy? There's no Zoomy support? Hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I can beat this code gen, unfortunately. It has like no optimizations. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think it can optimize, can it? Uh, const prop is done. Multiplies and divides are turned into shifts. Comparison operators are optimized with special caches of these. Uh, and jump optimization. Uh, I'm guessing there's no inlining either. Uh, I'm guessing it can't inline. Yeah, inline keyword is... Lucky you're not doing any cons or math. <laughs> Shit. Um, okay, can I do this? I just want to see if this uses multiple cores. Otherwise, I can invoke GCC three different times. Yeah, it doesn't look like that's doing anything. Oh, wait, wait. Maybe it's just not on screen. Nope. Okay, that's just one thread. Um, so we could invoke GCC. Don't think you're gonna optimize three hundred megs of code for free. Hey, it's not that hard of a problem. So should we just use Rust then? Rust was taking how long for four thousand lines? Like five seconds or something, right? Or like two, three seconds. Uh, 
um, roughly three seconds. So that should take like five seconds in parallel then. Obviously it has to link, but everything's going to have to link. We're, we're just bottlenecking on linkers when it comes to that. Um, okay. So here we got Rust again. And let's generate... Um, for grouping in zero dot dot... Uh, or start and chunks ooh dot step by four dot chunks one thousand um Yep, PC format, something like that, uh, for grouping, PC and grouping. Code this, okay. I mean, we can just do this. Uh, I, I. Ooh, you can't do chunks on a step by? Gross. Gross. Well, that's annoying. Um. Okay. Adders is start and step by four dot collect vec mm-hmm uh ref this Okay. Okay. Rusty. Rusty, this. No debug. Let's get some optimization. Um, make a dialib. Print the the that shit. Uh, code gen code one ninety two. Get rid of this. Oh, I mean that's the total time, which is kind of nice. So it took about a second to do that. We have 682, so we should be able to do 96 in parallel, so 682 divided by 96 times 0.752 should take us about 5 seconds to code gen, and then we have to link. Um, how do I do this with parallel? Uh, parallel ls code gen grep parallel echo this is that actually in parallel rusty create type dilib this okay <laughs> well, 
Will that time everything? I think it will. 8.2 seconds. 15 minutes. <laughs> Optimize it. Ah, <laughs> uh, we're making uh, we're making solutions to problems that only I can really use. <laughs> 8.706 uh objdump d m incel libcode 259 is a good one. Oh, that's putting all the rust in there again, isn't it? Um, create type dynamic lib emit object. This will probably be even faster because I think it stops when it gets to the object phase. Okay, so that was five seconds. Ha <laughs> 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 I uh, definitely did not mm, do that. Is there a way that I can do like uh how do how do I make a fucking library? Cuz for some reason it seems like this might actually be taking all of the programs, but the other one I don't know if it was. Yeah, like that's reading all the code files, and then this one, I feel like it's only doing the first one for some reason. No, it probably isn't. Um. No, that's reading all of them. Okay, so why is that producing something? Why is it only... Why is it omitting so much? Like, why is it only some of them when I do that? Um, pubfn, okay. Let's just see what happens if we do a single one. Okay. See, I'm going to press X to doubt. So, I linked code 264. Oh. What? Um... What? Rusty. Emit object. And that's what I'm doing. Hmm. So, what's going on there? Is is this just broken? Let's try emit lib. OK. 
code o.rlib. Why am I only getting one? Why am I only getting one function? Oh, yeah, they have the same body, so they're, yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Thank you. Okay, here we go. One of these, one of these is good. Mid object, all of them. Okay, maybe this will be slower now or faster. I don't know. Linking might be harder. It took like five seconds before. Now it took seven seconds. That's not bad. Now, code 259. Okay, so now we have a bunch of functions. So now, this is real. Come on, be fast, be fast, be fast. Zoomies, big zoomies. Come on, LD. Ooh, ooh. 10 seconds. 10 seconds. I can fuck with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the output code. It's just all the functions. How big is the A out? <laughs> um, 70, 79 megs. Uh... <laughs> hey, that's uh, that's some zoomies right there. Why does LD default to that first start? Mm. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> okay, so like in theory. Um, okay. <laughs> um, um, uh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh yep. And mm-hmm. It's gonna fill in the last one, yeah. I know. I know. Oh. 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 Oh yeah, these are all underscores. Okay, okay, okay. I saw the light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe maybe it was the errors. Maybe the errors were slowing it down. Maybe 
it was making a list of all the compiler errors and putting them in a vector and then reporting them at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm hmm. Okay. Okay. This is a stupid idea. This is such a stupid idea. But, you know, we're trying it. Fuck. Um, can't find A6. Oh, we didn't rerun this. Whoops. So, the error, the error theory still could hold true. Ooh. Ah. I think it was actually going slow on the errors. Um, the last one in each group will fail. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's actually a vector. It's a slice. Bring it. Come on, you bitch! Come on, 18 seconds. Wait! Was that faster? Wasn't it 18 seconds before? Woo! <laughs> I see what they did there. I see what they did there. Okay. Um. Is it fast because it's simple? Because should we write this in C or C++? If we do it in C, we can just zoomy. Go fast. <sighs> hmm. What advantages do we have in writing in Rust? We can do it safely. But I think C is probably just better here. Just the universe. There's just... We're not really... At this point, we're not benefiting from really anything in the Rust language. Um, can you have one move between random registers so the functions are doing something? Yeah, I could do that. If that's what you really want. Um... Um, um, um. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You see, you see where this is going, right? Yeah, you, you see it's going in a to a bad place. Ah, 
はあ。<笑> I Probably a U32, I think. <laughs> Yikes. Put some underscores on those. Come on. Come on. Come on! We're literally moving random registers around. Ooh, eight seconds! Um. It's because they have no exit point. They never actually do anything with it. Um. Else. Uh, code plus equals extern. Fn moose um can I do that without doing this we'll put it in curlys because I don't know format how why are we doing this um god we're doing some weird shit here aren't we Uh, uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, the last one. Has an extern fn, and then we invoke the extern fn. Ship it. Oh, come on. Ah, we can't have mute on those ones. Ha.、Uh, no mute args. Oh, uh, no name args. No reason to put names on them. Might actually save us CPU time. Now it's just gonna be the numbers, or the, the types. Um,. Doesn't need to be a format string. I don't really care. Moose, yup, takes all these args, ship it. Oh, fuck off. Oh, does it need the name? I didn't really read the message, but、uh, I think so. Come on. Come on. Ah,、uh, well, that's not right. The fuck's going on there? Oh, no name. What? Oh, we didn't. Okay.、Hmm. Memory. Wow, we're really struggling now. 
I'm trying to think like ahead where we're gonna end up being with this. I'm still trying to figure out what we, what we're possibly going to do. Huh? What the fuck? Oh, call to unsafe. Okay, so this should fill the link, but it should should build. We should be able to get all the object files. Um, no, not FFI safe. Extern Rust. I think I can do Extern Rust. It doesn't like the um, memory, the slice. Ah, uh, capital R for Rust, apparently. Oh, we can see all the things. Oh, yes, I want to do an MSP430 interrupt uh, ABI. That's really what I want to use right now. I'm surprised that even shows up on this target. Okay, not bad. This will fit. Uh, the linking should fail. Reference by code. Yep. Um, undefined symbol moose. Uh, yeah. So we can make. Uh, yeah. Let's just have. Do I really care? Do I really care? Uh, we can just call it, hmm, can we just call it memcopy? Is that valid? Can we just do that? I think it should be fine. It's just memcopy. No big deal. Just with some weird arguments. Nice. Ten seconds. Undefined symbol mem copy. Is that mangled? Is this showing the demangled name and it's actually mangled? Um I mean we can do this. Okay. Rusty create type dilib emits object o moose moose dot o. Oh, and we need to make that pub. Ah, there it is. Okay, so we have moose, and now hopefully we can do this. Got to put the args in there. I don't know if I have to. With mangling, with mangling, I might have to, but I'm not quite sure. I'm trying to be as lazy as I can, and okay, we can fix that. Undefined symbol moose. Really? Um. Future asm. Is it? Do the arguments matter? Um, can I do no mangle in this in, in here? I would guess I can mark something as no mangle. So now if I obj dump that, yeah, that's actually called moose now. And then we need to make sure that this 
calls the no mangle one, and it looks like this is fine. Copy the definition from your RS files. Yeah, could have done that. <laughs> oh. Oh, shit. No, oh, it's a lot. Oh, there's a lot here. This just calls moose. Guys, that propagated all the way. This is like the first, this is probably the first function, and it propagated all the way to the call moose. All it's doing is just filling in the registers and then calling moose. This might work. Holy shit, this might work. This might work. The fuck? Like, actually? This might work? We should probably switch it to C. We're, we're not getting anything out of Rust here, are we? Is there any reason to do this in Rust? Because C will just strictly be faster. Um... It's easier to read. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. I'm thinking. I'm thinking right now. Uh, I don't know. I feel like Rust has some nicer properties to it that I think will make it a little easier to write. Um, okay. 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 Um. Dude, Vim is really struggling right now. Vim is really struggling right now. Okay, instruction, opcode, coverage doesn't matter. Um, um, okay, so then we want... Uh, let mute reg names is equal to string new uh, or is vec new for ii and 0 to 33 uh, reg names we're still kind of pocking this out we're just going to blast through some of these real fast see if anything catastrophic happens um So regnames.push format this. So that is what we use to access a register. So we just say reg. Yeah, we'll just say reg. And then we can give it the index of the register index. And then that will give us the name of the variable. So then down here, what we can do is load upper immediate is um, uh, code plus equals format uh reg equals immediate 
So this will be reg inst.rd inst.immediate. Right? And that should build. Well, this shit won't build below us. But if we make this mute self, I think it will build uh, next inst. Yeah, we'll get rid of the concept of next inst. Okay. 20, 2193. Set PC. Oh, PC is a U size in this situation. Um, okay. So. I might just delete the bodies of these, maybe. I don't know. Um, I think we just go for it. I mean, I just don't want to fuck anything up r real early. Like, I want a way that I can test it. Um, yeah, I need to get this building so I can see. Uh, let's... PC equals PC as U64. Okay, see that's the that's what I wanted to see. I wanted to see stuff like this before I end up breaking everything. Slice indices have to be a U size. So right. So now we're learning kind of how we're gonna write this. Um, and we should be able to unhandled opcode this. Ah uh, yes. Um. So we're gonna have a lot of assertions because we are strict with this right now. So what we're gonna do is unhandled opcode will yield um, so at the start of the file we're gonna define that moose. Let's go find moose again. This and this. Okay, so we're gonna say at the start of the file, so we're making the file now, we're gonna make an extern moose, and then we're going to have a uh, let vm exit is equal to this. Right? And then what we should be able to do is on all the on all of these, uh, on dot star bang. This will yield code that will be um, code plus equals ref theme exits. And we'll improve this later with area codes. We're just trying to get some shit going for now. So, because now we're disassembling everything. And since we're disassembling everything, we're going to hit a lot of edge cases that we're not used to hitting, namely all of these unreachables. Bink, 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 bink. Okay, hopefully those work, because there's a chance that there's something wrong with this syntax, and I just copy pasted it everywhere, and then I might have to just undo everything I just did, which would kind of suck. Okay, um, 2494. Yeah, semicolon on that one. Yes, 2096. Uh, that starts here. Yes! So that's producing code. So why is that moose not in there? New line. Kind of confused there? Why moose wasn't at the top of the file? How is it at the end of the file?
How it, how is that at the end of the file? What am I doing wrong here? Oh, I have some breaks in here, don't I? No, I shouldn't. Uh, what is this? This is for each instruction, read the instruction, decode the instruction, do all this shit, and then at the end, add this. Oh, are we panicking in a different way? Yeah, we are. Uh, 690. My bad. Uh, in... So we have a read fault. And that would make sense, because these are still doing reads. So we'll just comment out these, because it, it was still doing uh, memory accesses and still like emulating stuff. And we just want to make sure it's not doing that right now. I just wanted to leave the uh, reference implementations in place here. So it's just a better indicator of what we need to implement. But this should shut that up. Okay, address miss. The fuck? Oh, did I break the emulator? Yeah, this is the emulator. Whoopsie daisy. Whoopsie daisy. There's the JIT. This is JIT reading instruction. JIT. Now we're in the right spot. So, yeah, I missed on the stores. I was about to say, it felt like I commented out an extra bank there. And it seems like I scrolled past the end of the file. Okay. So now this should, hopefully, exit with... Oh, syscall. Um, return. Get rid of that. Get rid of this. Okay. We're like kind of doing this weird thing where we left the emulator code in there and we're replace, replacing it piece by piece. So now we have moose at the top and then we have code now. And so like this one, this is the one we implemented. This just sets A5 equal to this. And then we want them to advance to the next instruction at the end. So we want to do code plus equals ref formats uh, inst... 018x, and then we pass in the args, something like that, right? Um, PC plus four, so advance to the next instruction. This is going to have assembly issues on the last one, um, but this code should be roughly correct. So we had this A5. So this will set A5 equal to this. And then it will invoke um, call args, I think. Something like that. Um, arg pass or something. Arg call. Do, do, do. So this does a, yeah. So here it does an arg call at the end. And let's throw a new line in here. Let's try to keep new lines in here. We're probably going to forget in a couple places. But it's not, I mean, it doesn't matter. It just makes it more debuggable. OK, so now this is going to be some real good looking code. So here, for example, this instruction, and if we do an objdump d dot slash objdump vim dash, and we search for 10f84, this one is a load upper immediate, and yep, it's loading a5 with this value, and then it goes and jumps to the next instruction. So hopefully, hopefully, this is the this is the thought 
is that all this stuff's gonna be magical and work, but this is not going to build because the last one uh, the last one in each isn't going to have a function. So I think what we'll do is say um, if uh, I, I is equal to um, grouping grouping dot len minus one then code plus equals x um ref format x turn inst under o eighteen x those are the args uh x turn rust function which takes these args um pc plus four and args so basically before the last one we'll define it as um for the last one that goes out of bounds of this file we'll mark it as extern so it can call into the next file Let's see how that looks. So the last one in here, it's like, yep, we know that we're in the last one, so we'll mark FAO as extern, and then we'll do a call to there, and we don't want the mute in there. We need the um, no name args. Okay. So this should be code that can build. It might not be able to link yet, based on the pub and how we're doing externs, but this should be able to build. Okay, it's not even close. Um, unsafe for this. Ah, fuck it. We're just going to put everything in unsafe. Um, Okay, now everything should be unsafe, which means we should be able to just ignore all those things. Can't apply to a U64. Um, yes. Um as i64 as u64 okay um warning unnecessary unsafe block i'm cool with that This is why I'm maybe not cool with it, because of because of how much of this we're gonna get. But like, son of a bitch. Um, how do I shut this up? Allow unnecessary. I'll allow something else. Ignore warnings. How do I... Can I do that globally? I don't know. I kind of want that. I, I want... Um, um... Dash A. Okay. Um... There we go. Allow unused unsafe.
Come on. Now we actually have stuff that it's thinking about. 15 seconds. It's getting worse, but it's not incredibly bad yet. It's like, it's looking feasible. Um, undefined symbol inst. I think we'll just say, um, let's say no mangle on this, maybe. Just mark everything no mangle. That should hopefully fix that. It'll kind of simplify things a bit. I think. And here's where we see that the calls are occurring and then everything's fucked. Okay. Yes, this is for the very last one in the very last grouping where that doesn't exist. Um, let's not fix the problem yet. Um, how do you use up arrow when you're doing control R? Seems kind of useless if you can't. Linking is very fast. Control R again. Oh, I see. Just spam it. Uh, here we go. Let's see. Let's take a little peek. Well, Pixie. Things will basically not be able to inline across the boundaries, but that's fine. I think these files will have enough next to each other that it'll be acceptable, hopefully. Holy shit. Oh, it inline stuff. Oh, it definitely inline stuff. I think that's why this is taking forever. Thirty-five million lines disassembled. Whoo! Honestly, that's not a bad build build time for that. Let's control C it. Hopefully we can get control. Oh, that's a call. Yep, it doesn't work. Yeah. Ah, uh, well, that was fun. Yeah, so all this was pointless. Okay, cool. Good to know. Um, well, guess that's the end of that. Oh, I bet this isn't a different unit. Wait, there's still hope. Still hope. Um... How do I turn on LTO? Um, uh, fat. Fat. Uh, didn't we have problems with static libraries not working? I think we had issues with static libs, right? Uh, and I, I have to let that go all the way to lib because I can't, I can't use object files for this now. Have to be library files. There's the instruction, and then hopefully there's an error somewhere, or there should be a section in here.
there should be a section which includes the, um, yeah, I think we're fine. So, LTO that, and then... Now, I don't know if we can link it with LTO. So here we do a static lib. I don't know if we can link with LD. I think we might have to use Rust to link it somehow to get LTO to work correctly. I'm not I'm not 100% sure. LTO is basically just going to keep the LVM IR in the um in the library. Okay, so now let's see if this is egregious. So this should now take longer. Oh yeah, and you can't, you have to have a .o file if you wanna do this shit. And I, I don't understand why. Um, M is for emulation, right? What are the emulation options? I forget how, like the concept of emulation and what it even does. Like what is target emulation? Um With the verbose or V options? Okay. Um. You sure? Um, okay, so then I say, please to be link all these things. <gasps> no way did that do LTO though. Um, Um, how do I LD into a shared object? Shared. What? A single dash? I saw two. But it doesn't seem to matter. Um Huh. Huh. The fuck? Basically, it just optimized everything out, but I don't know how it does that. Um. 
There's code in there. Yeah, it's definitely making a NSO. Um, if I do shared, and then if I do file, wait, what? Uh, how do I get that to produce a build a shared object? Cool. I would expect that to uh, output a shared object. I, I might not be the best program in the world, but my guess is that I would expect a shared object out of, a, out of something that produces a shared object. Unless it's not naming it a.out, but I'm pretty sure it is. Nope. Unless a uh, file is wrong here, and it might be. Hmm, I don't think it is, though. Uh... How hard would you say it is to port the current emulator to being able to fuzz those are native x64 binaries. Quite difficult. You'd have to implement a whole new CPU engine. Um, so I would, I would kind of expect that it would create... When I ask for a shared object, it would then create a shared library. Dash E... Um, am I crazy for thinking that? Am I crazy for expecting a shared a shared object? I guess it's not using anything in the dot a files. But then. It's just not using any of the code from the A files. Um. Wow. The fuck? Uh, link static A files. Oh my god, link static library. 2SO. B dynamic. What's B dynamic? Just, just be dynamic. Um, like that's easy. Exactly link against a shared object library. Yeah, that's not what I want. I want. Okay. Okay. I feel like I should know how to do this. Yep, you archive them. Ranlib just gives you the index. 
make the final dynamic library output an SO whole archive from this the fuck is this shit um gcc shared whole archive output a dot out i i like what's happening I see. I see. Um, I think redefinitions are ignored with optimizations. No. Because this doesn't work, right? Hmm. whole archive to extract the option argument so that all of the object files in the archive are individually added to the link command line. Okay. That's pretty close to what I want. Um, I don't think I can LTO with object files, but let's try it. Rust. We're going to emit obje uh, objects. Time this code gen. Emit objects. I don't think. I don't think you can do LTO on object files. I could be wrong. I think this is gonna be a problem. Pretty sure this is gonna be a problem. We're gonna have the same issues. What? Multiple definition, yeah, that's ignored with uh, this. Okay, maybe it just works in GCC. So... I feel like that was trying. What if I don't do shared? It is slower, so I am curious if it is doing LTO. Uh, Moose.o. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Moose. Uh, Mit object. Create an object. Time this. Multiple definition of moose. Yep, not surprised there. Start auto. So there's no start, and then the Rust personality stuff is a bit of a problem. Um. Hmm. Oops. Shared lid? Well, what was it complaining that I need fat for? Well, it works for a library. Let's 
try this. It's going to be the same problem, I think. No, this one might not be. Fuck. Uh... Oh, uh, we can also do this. Um... Let's try... Wang bang, no standard. Turn off the standard library. That might help a little bit with build times too. Panic handler required, but why? Lib. Shouldn't need a panic handler for lib. This might fix that problem. Oh, and I didn't run this command like this before as a library. Okay. Okay, so that worked. And then we also have this. Come on. Holy shit. Holy shit. Is that doing LTO? I don't think so, but why is it so much slower? I'm curious. Um, LSL A dot out. Massive. Perfect. Uh, head N50. Okay, so this is still doing calls. Yeah, let's try it with... Uh, LLD link. Oops. And yeah, it's not doing LTO. Um, and why? Why is it not doing LTO? Um, I don't know if I can use object files like that. Okay, let's try this. Let's see what the lib outputs. Cause I know that we can we can definitely LTO a library. And that produces what? An R lib, I think? An R lib. I think it makes an R lib. Yeah, just an rlib. Okay, so now we'll emit a library. Parallel rough C create type lib. Okay, that's good. And now this will make a bunch of rlibs. And hopefully the rlibs... I don't even know if I can use them with LD, to be honest. Start at rlib. M x86 elf. What was it? Ugh. Elf under x86 64. Okay. Now it's being smart again. Yeah. Uh, 
Oh yeah, um, what's the... The good flag. Whole archive. Not an L file. Okay. Help. Force load all members of a static library. Um... Can I use Rust C to link? How do I how do I link with Can be that a static, a framework, or that? Link the generated traits to the specified okay. So let's see if we can do L equals L code 282 test.rs, which apparently exists. FN main this. Okay. libcode282.rlib How the fuck do I link against an rlib? This does... I don't know how I actually link with, um... I don't know how I link with Rust. Link the generated crates uh, to the native library name, blah, blah, blah. Oh, plane flying really low here. Um. I just don't get how I... Rust link rlib. Check what build verbose does. Yeah. And X turn name equals Well, that's not documented here. I don't see it at least. Um The fuck? Okay, how big is test if I don't do that? About the same. Um. Lib code two eighty two dot rlib. Extern rust. Fn this no mangle. Okay. On the find a reference to that.
memory, and then VM exit. Oh, what? So you're telling me, you're telling me that you can find it and tell me how many arguments that requires, but you can't fucking link against it? You bitch. <laughs> really? Oh, that's linking to the next thing. That's linking to the next thing. Foo two. And that one's gonna get upset. Right? Did we get a new error? One, two, four, five, thirty. One, two, four, five, thirty. Oh, it's probably in some other shit. Okay. Um Because one of these things calls something else in another rlib. And I can't do that. I'm pretty sure if I did extern for all of the rlibs, I'm pretty sure. So, like, where is this? So we can see it's in 282, 283, 1245E0. And we're linking against 282. And 282. It's extern from here, and it's defined in 283. So I would expect How does that not go away though? One, two, four, five EO. And that's defined in this one. It's because I'm not giving it a name. Oh, what the fuck? I don't know, man. Like, it has to be possible. Okay, so this is the link invocation. WL as needed. And then it passes our libs directly. Be static. Okay, some of these things might be important. Where's the last link attempt that we tried? So we had problems with this Y. Because... CC... Let's see what CC can do here. Link that shit. Okay. Um. W as needed. Comma dash dash as needed. Whole archive. Okay, so let's do as needed, and then let's not build a shared, and then we just need to make one of these things needed, and to do that, we'll do um, test.c, int main void, call this shit. We need to mark that extern, I think. 
Uh, no main. Yep. Test.c. Now we have a main. Undefined reference to this. Okay. So it does do a WLB static prior to the RLib. So let's see if that's important. I don't think it is. Wait, what the fuck? Uh, is that failing because of something else? Let's try test.c first, because I think they are in order. Can't find LGCCS. Um, start group and end group, dash L G C C S. Okay. Is it because of that B static? W L B dynamic. Ah, I see. I see. Mm-hmm. Oh shit. Oh shit. <laughs> Fuck. Um. Oh. <laughs> Holy fuck. Oh shit. Wow. We doing it? <laughs> it's runnable. It actually runs. We got the moose. <laughs> oh my god. It still has calls. Still has calls. Uh, I don't think it's LTO'd yet. Let's... How the fuck did we get that verbose thing? I think we just tried to build something and it failed. We did like this. Perfect. So... Um, C, LTO, fat. Okay, this is what I like to see. Undefined reference, but this is trying to link. I don't see any LTO related things in here. P thread, dynamic, end group, start group. I don't think it'd be a Z now. Yeah, what differs between these things? Let's try LTO's thin. Okay, stuff changes and I don't understand what. Output test, that has changed. Z now. Non-lazy runtime binding. Well, let's just grab some of these things, see what happens. Um, uh, 
Let's GC some sections. That's easy. Garbage collect sections that aren't used. Uh, Railroad. Z now. Library. A start group, a B static, an end group. And then some shit here. Compiler built-ins. Everything else. So we have... This is our object we built, and then it's linking against uh, some of the Rust libraries. I just don't... I mean, it's hard to say if it just doesn't work, or if it's doing... Or if it's not doing LTO. Did we build those optimized? I think we did. Um, optimized. Fat. It might just not work. That's calling five. Why would it be doing a call for a lot of these? What do we do? We just call the next thing. I think it's just due to the args. I don't know if they can tail call if there are that many args or something. There's main, calls into this. That's the only thing I could think of. Yeah, I, I just, I don't think this concept's gonna work. It took a while to figure it out, but I, I just don't... I don't know if we're gonna be able to coerce this to do what we want it to do, unfortunately. Now we could still, um, huh, what could we do here? So this is where main jumps to. And then that's a jump, and that jumps to this. Oh, that's the got. That's probably jumping to the next instruction. Oh, um, what if, is this an issue with it being relocatable? I mean, I would expect that the linker would resolve these like why would i do a deref why do, why would i do a rip rel deref like why would i access the got um it's so the code can be relocated and let's see let's let's um rusty help See help. Print code models. I forget what the um, relocation model. Here we go. Static. We're doing some shit here. C relocation model static. <laughs> We're doing some weird shit here. I feel like I'm making a kernel where you're just trying to get everything to line up in the perfect way. So moose. 
Relocation model static. LTO fat, libs for all of them. Link it. Did this change anything? No, it's still using the got. Is there like a no pick or something? Nope. Oh. I think this one might be a rip. We could maybe omit functions at a time to see. And then have them optimize the registers. Um, or optimize blocks, but even then, I don't think it's going to optimize away some of the memory accesses. And I don't know if there's a way to guarantee that it doesn't get um that it doesn't have a data section. It's kind of like writing shell code in C, but let's let's try this. Um, Rust C. O C L T O is full on test.rs or er, LTO is, is fat. Um So this should produce a test, an LSL test, and that's massive. Okay, so why is that massive? No standard. So let's try and get this smaller and smaller. Um, C, I guess we only care about the object, but yeah, we can do no standard for this. Um, C or emit object C create type lib okay obj dump d test.o we basically want to do what godbolt is doing so you want to take something and here we go so here's main So, what we want to do is take in the registers, which will, in this case, this will actually be memory. Uh, mute registers. Struct registers. And then racks. Right. RBX, CX, DX, GX. JK. Uh, regs. Plus equals... Uh, regs dot racks plus equals one minus equals five. And pub. Okay, so this is good. This is just subtracting four from something dereft on that structure. Now the question is, that's acceptable. And then if I panic here, this should give me a problem. Oh, oh that's going to call panic. And that hasn't resolved yet. How do I 
Um, obj copy. I want to keep only the text. Dump section text test dot o text text okay um obj copy text only I need to I need to basically uh, only section text dash o binary can we just do o binary Oh yeah, that outputs a binary, which is a dot out. Uh, oh. No. Test dot bin. Oh, it clobbered test dot o, didn't it? Okay, so we have test.o. Let's try output to test.bin. Output. What the fuck? Oh, you just give it the file name afterwards. Okay, I see. Okay, so that's fucked then. Um, test.bin. Okay, so that file format's fucked. There we go. So now, file test.bin, lsl test.bin. Okay, so this is only that part. And then how do I make sure that when I strip it out, it yells at me if there's anything that's not resolved? Um, wait, what? Only text. Oh, yeah, they name it a weird thing. Um, so I really wish this would yell at me. I guess I want to link into a, like a shared object. Maybe um, GCC shared test.o. So that made a test.so, right? Or a, did that make a.out? What the fuck did that output? Test.so. Test.so. Obj dump d test.so. So that's calling panic. How the fuck does that know to, um... How the fuck is that linking? How does that link? How does it resolve that, uh, import? Um, like, I would expect that would fail, because how does it get... Could you do a very simple linker in Rust? Cat each of these functions together, keep track of where each one starts in the concatenated files, and fix up the unresolved jumps. Yeah, I mean, there might be some weird things that I could do here, but they start to get more complex than just outputting LVM IR. Although, I don't know, man. There's... I really want to get this code out of this file. That's what I really want to do right now. And
Nice. That's what I want. But how the fuck does that work? Because it's shared. Um, let's do static. Test.a. Is that is that valid? Test. Uh, can I do that? I want to statically link that, and then this is yelling at me, which is great. That's exactly what I want it to do. Because if I got rid of panic here, I shouldn't have that problem. Um, I should now be able to link this, and I can. It doesn't find start, but that's not a big deal. Now that guarantees. Um. Read elf l test dot a. Oh yeah, and then we can do this. Um, C unwind is abort. Panic is abort. Static we link that, and now we only have a text section. Um. So this is the header, the read-only header, and we only have a text section now. And since we only have a text section, we know that this code is safe to run in any environment. Because we can just rip it out, right? So if we grab these commands, this, so Rust see that, then we want to statically link it, and we'll just link it to test, not test.a. Um, this is all. So emit that, create type lib. So emit an object, then we statically link that object, and then we want to inspect the sections. Um, so this, if we see anything other than text, we're going to have a problem. And create type lib. We're not doing panic abort anymore. Oh, yeah. If we put panic in here, that fails because there's no panic, which is great. So we only have the object file of this. So we only have the code from here. We only have a text section, which means that we can do an obj copy... Um, so we can do this to rip out the text section, uh, only section text to test that bin. Then we can obj dump d test dot bin. We can't object dump that. I don't think obj copy, um, only section space. Only section equals. Okay, that's not working. And then ob dump is failing. So we can do nasm f bin or er, n disasm b64 test dot bin. What? What? Oh, uh, that's on test. Oh, this needs to be on test. Make. Okay, so now we have basically shell code that does what we want it to do. And in this case, this gets optimized, right? So if we had this where we lift all of our RISC-V instructions and then we emit this, this like shell code, this will then tell us. So let's see if we can do static mute, um, static foo u64 is 5. And then let's add plus equals five. Now, it probably just knows that that can't change. Um, let's make this static mute. Oh, and I literally did five. Uh, foo, make this unsafe. I just want to see what's going to happen here. I guess there's no other code that can modify that. 
um, pub static mute. Here we go. Okay, so now we're doing a rip relative access. Um, and this is what I need to avoid, right? I think the IR route is the way to go to start with. I mean, I would just do an IR myself, but emitting to LVM IR is going to be pretty messy. You still have to deal with like how you chain instructions together. You still ultimately have the exact same problem that we're trying to solve right now because LVM is not going to link all of your instructions together. So it's up to us to produce code that has the correct calls and jumps and we right now don't have a way of doing that so even with an ir we can't really go down that route you can have rusty emit ir i mean there's not really a reason like if like what would what would I do differently to that IR compared to the binary that is output by LLVM? Like, what transform am I going to do on the IR? Because I have to do a transform. Otherwise, it's identical. If I don't do a transform, I'd get the same code out regardless of if I stop it halfway through and grab the IR. So I have to do a transformation to that IR. So what transformation am I going to do? Right? I could maybe try and transform every call into a jump and hope that doesn't break things. But that's really hard to prove and do correctly. And at that point, it's a very complex optimization problem. You just admit an uh, unconditional jump, put the regs in the correct way to form your own ABI. But I would still need to create all the IR around that. And at that point, I could just output assembly just as a... Like, I just don't think I'm getting that much out of it. The, the problem is, is I can't express something in the IR in a way that it can be optimized right now. The only reason you go to an IR is so you can do transformations and optimizations on it. And LVM will do that. If I produce, if I produce LVM IR directly, LVM will optimize certain things like these loads and stores and stuff, and and do const propagation, which is great. That's that's super exciting. Um, but it's if it can't already do it in the way that I'm expressing it in Rust, then the way that I give it the LVM IR is likely not going to be much different. just make them basic blocks in a single function. And then that's what I'm doing right now, right? I put, I put everything, put, I turn this into a basic block, I compile it, and then I just get the code. And at that point, I don't need the IR, right? You see what I'm saying? Unless I'm doing a transform on the IR, I'm not benefiting at all from it. And writing a transform for the IR means I would have to write a more sophisticated optimization pass than what clang already has in terms of that specific case and if i'm putting everything in one block if i lift all the instructions in a block and put it in a function then that's what i can just do that with rust i don't need to go to the ir because i can just write it in rust and then i can build this and then we don't care about how long it takes to process it because we only do it as we hit the instructions basically we would replace the jit with something that instead of generating NASM files that get assembled for each basic block, we generate Rust, which would then compile, and then we'd grab the shell code out of it as long as we have the same calling convention. Um, so, so you have all the jump targets? Well, that's why it's a JIT. Like, literally, our JIT already 
emits a basic block worth of assembly, calls NASM, invokes it, and then when it sees a new entry point to something, relifts it. And we would do the same thing, except we'd produce uh, Rust. Now, the reason why I didn't do it in Rust the first way, and not in NASM, is because if I produce Rust, I don't know if it has external dependencies. And that's what I'm trying to make right now. Right now, I'm trying to make a way that I can build a function and guarantee it has no external dependencies. In this case, there are external dependencies. And the external dependency is a data reference here. And what I need to do is I need to make a way that I can link this or build this or validate sections to guarantee that it doesn't touch anything outside of just this code. And in that situation, I can then use it and start jumping between these, or more specifically, I know there's going to be a red at the end. I can trim off the red. I could do the head, ahead of time uh, thing still. If you uh, just make, as an example, the current function you have up there, uh, be output as three functions. First is three instructions, uh, second is final two, and last is one instruction. But how am I not going to have the jump problem I had before? Like, honestly, the ahead of time thing might work if I don't have as many registers passed in or as many args. But to be honest, in my opinion, ahead of time is worse than just in time. Because ahead of time means I have to do it for the whole 2 meg binary rather than the 10k of the binary I actually use. I, I would like to do the ahead of time thing if I get cross-function optimizations. Otherwise, if I'm only getting intra-block or intra-function optimizations, I don't really want to do ahead of time anyways. With the exception of having like a faster startup time. But I don't think this will be too bad. Because this builds basically instantly. But I could potentially output the IR and then literally replace any call with a jump. And just assume that's going to be correct. Um, but that's really risky. I'd rather go this route. Where I output Rust code. So I'll do the JIT. As I observe new things. I'll lift the block basically until I get to an indirect jump. I'll just keep lifting forever. I'll then build the rust. And that includes, I think I can include indirect branches in here. Um, yeah, I should be able to include indirect branches in here. So that means like indirects and everything, like the whole function will get lifted, or not indirect, um, conditional branches. And then when I get to the ret of whatever I'm lifting, that's the end. I invoke uh, I invoke the assembler and or I invoke Rust in this case and I get this output. So all I need to do now is I need to make sure that this doesn't have an external reference. But I honestly have no idea how to validate that because there's no data section. So that's what I'm really confused about. If I don't do only section, so let's just say, let's just say I will do all sections. I see. Yep. So how the fuck? Why is it saying there's only a text section? Offset, file size 5 bytes, file size 120 here. Oh, am I doing it on the wrong file? Test.a, I am. There we go. Yeah, okay, this is what I need to avoid. Basically, if I produce something that doesn't touch data, there should only be a text section. Uh, there's an EH frame and data here, and to get rid of that, we need to do... I was wondering why this didn't show up before. Uh, panic is abort. 
so now we have text and data. And we have data because of this mute foo. If we didn't have that, we just have text. How are you? I think it's cool to start programming in JavaScript. Uh, I'm a beginner in the programming area. I think uh, JavaScript's a good place to start. So is Python. But Python and JavaScript are great, great to start. Just start, yeah, learning whatever. OK, so how do I make sure there's only a text section in this file? Um, is there a way for me to do that? Because if I can guarantee there's only a text section, I can safely rip out the text section and execute it. And then that way, I'm basically, I'm trying to make a safety net to make sure I don't accidentally use something in Rust that pulls in a library or something that can't be used in a JIT context, right? I need to make sure that the code that I get out of this tool is directly usable. Um, so how do I do this? Um, read elf. I could, I could strip out the text section and then also strip out the, hmm. I could skip, um, average copy, ensure text only. Is there a way for me to do this? I can skip sections, I think. Um, only section, copy only the name section to the output. Okay. Um, like I know I could write a Python script that maybe parses this. What if I what if I do this? I'm gonna put foo back in here, so I'll have a data section, and then what if I do a non-binary copy of that first, where I copy only the text section, and then is there a way to validate that this is a valid thing? Ooh, I can do this. I think, I think, if I basically strip out everything except for the text section, and then this will probably fail the link now. Shit. Really? Oh, there's not even any section in there. Oh, I guess that's why. Um, can I do a wildcard? So it's not actually called text is the problem. Uh, so it's actually called read elf l test dot o. Because I end up stripping out that section. Hmm. I'm trying to find a clean way to do this rather than like regexing to like parse these sections out to like just actually make sure there's no sections. Um. Because so I'm pretty sure I can do. H is sections, isn't it? H. Section headers, test.o. Yeah, so there are a couple different text sections in here. Um, is this going to change each time? 89ee? No, it's not. Okay. So, this, let's try and let's just see what happens if we were to have stripped this out. So if we strip out everything, so we strip out this section, will this fill the link? 
No. Unless that's not the name of the text section anymore, but I'm pretty sure it is. Oh, it's text dot, not text dash. Okay. Because I would expect this to fail to link. Now we have a text section, and for some reason it still can link, and what the fuck output code do we get then? Oh, I guess we weren't using the data. Ah, there we go. Symbol, required but not present. Okay. This is what I want. This way, I can have a data section, but if it's not used, it doesn't matter. And then if I end up using it, it's like, yo, dog, you don't have this. So how do I do only section... Um, and I can't do a wild card. Wait, does that work? Text A, make. Okay, that stripped everything. And text star. Text star. Make. That works. Nice. Um, so this is... Can I do a comment on a line like that? I think I can. So this is compile the uh, Rust file to an object. This is... Um, okay, now comments are fucked, aren't they? I think in make files you're supposed to have comments on the start of the line or some shit. Why is this breaking colorization? Um, strip everything except for the uh, text section. Text sections. And then this is uh, link into a static uh, binary. This will fail if the file referenced any section other than text. Um, and then here we just uh, strip out the text section and then uh, display the disassembly, which is just for debugging. Oh, yeah, convert to a binary file. We're not actually ripping out the text section there because we don't need to. So then, if we put this in here, that gets mad at us, which is great. That's what we want. And then if you put this back in, nice. And then we can, ha we can have a data section. We just can't use it. And what if this wasn't pub or whatever? This is just static mute. Would this fail? This doesn't fail um, because it's constant. But if I made this static mute, this probably now fails. Oh, it's still apparently constant. Because I think it can prove that no one can uh, modify it outside of the compile unit, which is kind of good to know. But this is good. This is good. Strip only the text sections out. This is looking good. Okay, so then, let's say uh, if regs.rax is greater than 5, um, could I actually lift the whole function like this? Could I, okay, so I'm, I'm chugging, I'm chugging, I'm chugging, I get a conditional branch, and then I could just lift everything under there, I could just recursively go through. Um, so like I lift an add one to racks, I lift a subtract five from racks, and then I get to a compare. Um, regs RBX plus equals five. Like this code gen's gonna be nice. Yep, and there are no external references. And let's see if it caches that in a register. Yeah, look at this. See, I would not be able to optimize this well. 
right? This is going to be pretty good. It would be kind of hard to beat this. Like, this is pretty complex to, to optimize at this level because this got const propped. The axis of registers got deferred to only one load, one store. Um, it used an LEA. It used a conditional move when it was able to for a small enough uh, operation. Like... This would be pretty good. What are we talking about? Talking about learning languages? You haven't looked at... I think my brother used one of the, the code, like code Academy or something like that to learn Python. I think he said it was pretty good. Um, this is good. Now the question is... Can we guarantee that we can remove the ret, or do we just not care? Well, actually, we can't have a ret. Um, what if we say it doesn't return? Um, actually, can I do this? Uh, that's still going to ret, but I think it guarantees the frame will be simplified. How would I get this to not have a ret? I could probably literally just cut off the last byte, like assert that the last byte is a C3, and if it is a C3, then remove it. Um, and if it's not a C3, panic. But I also don't know how to handle if there are internal rets. Hype, love the content. Thanks for the kind words, Nightshade dude. Yeah, how do we make sure this doesn't return? Um... That's kind of my biggest concern right now, is trying to figure out how to have this not re uh, not return. Otherwise, it's not very useful. Um, you can do naked functions in Rust. Do naked functions not return? I mean, we we try we tried the naked function and it didn't work, but maybe that's because it's pub. Um Like how would I How would I have this not return? I'm not sure. Hmm. Like, that's kind of tough. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a normal reason you can leave out a ret. Right. Well, that makes this really tough, then. Um... Like, I can cut out... I can cut out the, um... I can just manually cut out the red, but that... I can't, I can't know if there's going to be multiple return paths through a function, right? If there's a, if there's an early return or an, another way to return from a function, um, 
then I'm gonna have problems. So this will get optimized really small, which is nice. And in this case, Maybe put an asm statement that you can uh, recognize and then call another function that doesn't return. Yeah. I think that's fair. I just need to make sure that it doesn't end up putting multiple returns. So if I do this, I think it puts a ud2 at the end of the function instead. Um, no ret. Okay. I'm guessing it just has to assume that this doesn't return. Um, like, I don't think it's capable of knowing that that assembly can't return. Like, how would it know? How would I force that? Um, I mean, I can literally do this. That jumps to 30. Uh, okay, that's EBFE. So at the end, it aligns and then it loops forever. Um, that's not very clean, unfortunately. Inline always. Okay. So I can do some crazy shit. I can do some really weird shit here. Um. Oh, uh, Rust Asm. There's probably a way I can say no return for Asm. I bet I can say no return. Yeah, no return. Nice. Um, that's like attributes equals or some shit. Option. Is it this? Nope. Option. No, oh, man. Okay, let's try and find an example. Options. Are they not in quotes? They're not. Option, no return. Okay, options. Okay, so now if we didn't have this, this would fail to build. So now we need to make sure that no ret is at the end of all of them. And basically, it makes that call, and the call does nothing. Um, so here's the end, right? Here's storing the register out. Um, what I'd like to do would be... Huh... Um, so how do I make sure it doesn't have multiple return sites? If I only do one, the function call at the end, is there ever a situation where it will dupe this call and move it to a different location in the function and have an early return? Otherwise, I have this idea. Right, I can do this. Right, I added a 53. So I can do like... 
I can put a marker in there. Okay, um, so, if I do this, what's my concern? Okay, first of all, this pushes racks. So, that fucks up my stack. Yeah, that fucks up my stack. And I think that's no return, getting, getting mad at me. Let's try this. That still propagates no return, I think. Let's do this. That will pop after this, and then ret. Um. I guess I want to pass regs here. Right? Okay, I was kind of hoping that would move the pop before. Um, then if this is no return, if that is no return, then options, no return. I want it to care about popping that register. Man, that's tough. Um, I'm really just only concerned of multiple return paths because if I just delete the return, I know that this is just falling through to the next instruction and I don't have to worry about it. Um, Hmm. Like this is valid code. And the the only reason this wouldn't work is if it could branch somewhere else. So how do I handle branches? When I want to do a jump indirect, how do I do that? Unless I just say ret is okay. And maybe I just have calls and rets, and I try and lift as much as I possibly can, and the return code is the, like, um, PC target of the next instruction. And then it doesn't matter if I can return out from some place early. So let's say, in this situation, um, we want to return to leet, and this one we want to return to dead. And then in this situation, if I don't have either of them return, it's invalid, right? If, if this one didn't set that, then this would fail at compile time due to not having all return paths covered. Now the question is, can I get this function, that whatever I lift, to be large enough such that I don't care about doing calls and rets, right? So if I'm lifting risk five instructions and like I come across a conditional and I load the conditional into this, like I load one side of the conditional into here and the other side, like basically every time I see a conditional branch, I queue up decoding for this location 
I basically do a recursive call. So I see a conditional branch and I load up one of the paths here and I load up the other path here, the fall through path here and the taken path here. Um, I just don't know how I handle loops then in that case. I'm gonna be right back, I'm gonna hit the head. Okay, so how the fuck would I handle a loop if I did this? I think loops would be too hard, so I think I want to lift blocks. And I don't know if I want to call in or return every single block. But I think blocks, blocks won't have conditionals. And since blocks won't have conditionals, they won't have multiple return points. Um... Hmm... I wonder if I can tail call this. I wonder if I can tail call to delete rets. That might be a little iffy. Might be a little unreliable. And get rid of the semicolon. Will this tail call into that assembly, which would be really interesting? No. Because this still has a ret. And if I say it's no return, then that information gets propagated up. Um, okay. So this is this is really hard to think through how I want to structure this. I could have calls and rets and it would probably be faster than what I have now. It, it probably truly would. If I would just lift every instruction in the block until I get to a branch, once I get to a branch, I return the address that I want to branch to. Um Yeah, I guess 
I just want to prove that there's only one ret. If I can prove there's only one ret, then it's not a big deal. Um... I also need to be able to call into the next thing to JIT. So, I kind of need this no return structure that I had before, where basically I need these functions won't return. And what I want it to do is no ret, where this just goes to the next instruction effectively. Um, and then we can try naked on this. But effectively, we actually need to emit the jump code that we use. Now, here we have a stack on the alignment. Now, I can deal with that. I can deal with the stack getting fucked. Because I can... Um, if the stack gets fucked, I... Let's see. Oh, yeah. How do I store things in registers? Mm. I just permanently keep them as args. So we'd have like a jump table, which is a pointer, right? This jump table is a pointer, and then I pass this, right? This is the stuff that we kind of keep in storage in our uh, current JIT. Um, we'll make this extern fn. That way it's there. And then what I want to do is I want this no ret, and this is like um, jump to, and then this will take a PC, and then this will be the same logic that we currently do in our stuff uh, to jump to that, where we basically uh, look up PC and table, uh, jump uh, racks, we're like, we resolve PC and then we jump. Right? Because this is what we currently do. We basically look up the PC, we look it up in a table, and then we end up jumping to, to racks. So what I want to do is make something like this, and then this would jump to, and this would just be the next instruction. Let's say it's 5004 instead of 5000. Um, and then that needs to be no return, which it is. And this needs to get rid of the semicolon. Oh, yeah. Uh, it doesn't need to. This is jump to there. So now, this has a jump rack. Now, we still have the problem of this push. Um, and I don't know if there's a way for me to solve that problem. Um... No mem pure. I think but by default the new asm is strict. So I need a way for this to know that it has to restore the stack. And I'm surprised it doesn't already know that. What if we mark this as not no return? Nope. Huh. Okay. Would it be possible to mark all the jump par targets in a first pass in the function, and then you break into the function into parts between the jump markers, and all the separate functions uh, have an if condition at the end that either call A or B. Yeah. Let's see. Um, you break into the function into the parts between the jump markers. All the separate functions have an if condition at the end that either calls A or B. Like, that's what I'm thinking of doing right now. Kind of. Let's get uh, naked functions. Naked functions does get rid of the push. I mean, this is good now, right? 
We load the register. We subtract four from it. We compare it. We then modify it accordingly to this. We then store it back out before we do jump to because it has to assume that that can be clobbered. And then we jump to there and jump racks. So, like, did naked work? Uh, Rust naked function. What does it allow? Um, function stack layout interpretation, blah, blah, blah. Yep, interrupt handlers. Yep. Sub RSP, blah, blah, blah. Um. It should have the prologue and epilogue omission disabled. Not guaranteed to match any calling convention the compiler is compatible with. Calls to naked functions from within Rust code are forbidden unless the function is also declared with a well-defined API. Um, yep, I agree. So, how do, so that gives me complete control of the stack, um, and let's do extern, oh, we do have it extern C. If we said extern rust, does this fail to build? No, it doesn't. Should, in my opinion. Should. But extern C, just to be explicit, even though extern implies C. Um, if we don't do naked here, we have that push racks. So if we do naked, then that goes away. But why? Push racks. Because this doesn't return anything, so it, do you have to preserve racks? I don't think so. The question is, can I guarantee I have no large stack things? So let's say if we have a large stack thing, OU850, does this fail? Oh, well, I don't use it. Um, large stack thing 47 is regs.rdx. Okay. As you ate. Uh, make that mute. Um, core pointer right volatile. Mute. Try to zero. Um, whoa. Whoa. So it doesn't fail to build. And it also doesn't make room on the stack. I'm concerned what would happen if I use a naked function and I use too many variables. I don't think I would, but imagine I end up using a shit ton of variables. Will that end up causing... Uh, something like this to happen where it's writing beyond the stack. Um. So here's something that I could do that solves every problem I've described so far. I'm concerned about returns, 
potentially causing us to to ret back when I don't want to ret. I'm concerned about stack usage, whether it's allocating a temporary on the stack or anything. I don't want any fucking stack usage. And you know how I can make sure that's safe? I can just destroy RSP. Before, like, before I enter the JIT, before I jump into the JIT, I can set RSP to four ones. And that way, if anything ever touches the stack, makes a variable on the stack, forks the stack to make RBP or makes any locals or accesses it in any way, it will just crash. I think that is probably the way that I'll go about it. I think I'll do the naked functions, which should guarantee that there are no stack accesses. So, um, naked functions, no stack accesses, clobber the stack before I use it, and then at this point, this should now work again. Then jump to, all of these are marked no return, such that if I don't call something that's no return, basically if I don't call jump to, then it will fail to build. Um, and that makes sure that every single exit path, so let's say this is a conditional, and we go to, right, let's say this function, this function is literally uh, add one to racks, subtract five from racks, compare if racks is greater than five, if it's greater than five, then we jump to, like, way out of here, like somewhere else. Otherwise, I jump to the next instruction, I jump to the fall through case, and this code is valid. Um... Okay, now this is confusing. Oh, because this asm doesn't take in any information, so it assumes that it does the same thing in both cases. So let's make this more complex. Let's say that we want to pass in um, jump table. So let's jump to jump table and then jump table. In reality, we would use all of these things, right? Jump table is a reg, uh, an input, which is a register, which comes from jump table. Um, and then I also have to take in PC. Uh, which is an input, which is in a reg, and it's PC. And then, let's say we have uh, regs, which is an input, which is into a reg, and it's regs as pointer, or something. In fact, let's just make sure that ends up in RDI, or something. Just so we honor the calling convention or whatever we do. So in this case, if we just say this needs to go into RDI and then PC goes into PC, then we can do like a magic math, add jump table PC, right? Let's assume that is how we look up the thing in the jump table, which is definitely not how it's done, but let's assume it is. In out, this goes to nothing. So we're saying that jump table also gets clobbered. And here we go. As some outputs are not allowed in no return. Okay, then I'll just clobber it. Um, as, oh, this is just regs. It's already a pointer. Okay, so this now, like, man, there's just no way I'd be able to beat this. Um, okay, so let's see what this does. This moves RDI into racks. Not sure why yet. Um, I think it's because I force it here. So let's just say I just need to put that in a reg. Um, and then here we'll just say foo is equal to this. And then we'll just move RDI foo. 
Okay, yeah, that helped it. Right, if we can let the register allocator allocate the registers itself, it's going to do a better job. So, here's what we do. We load racks, which is uh, in RSI. So we deref the registers, we get access to racks. We subtract 4 from it, which is the const prop result of these things. We then compare it with 5. If it's not above, then we um, go to here, where we jump to... Uh, we load EAX with 19,000, um, and we do our jump table calculation. This is all of our assembly, so this is where we put our jump code that handles whatever our jumping stuff is. Um, and PC isn't always constant. One second. Okay, so I would like for this to not do an additional move, but it doesn't matter too much. Um, I'll probably make a jump to, maybe a jump to constant variant that would take a constant value. Because you can do constants with... I mean, I guess I'm the one doing the add. It loads it into EAX, and then at that point, I could actually use that however I want. Um, I would prefer for that move EAX to not happen, though. In some cases, I think I'll have an optimized case that's going to be like a jump to constant. And that will bake in the constant value. Um, basically, what we'll do is if the, if the branch target... Uh, once we resolve the branch target by calling the JIT, we or jump returning out of the JIT by uh, doing a VM exit, we could have the um, we could have uh, what could we have it do? I'm trying to think through how I want to do VM exits now, but um, let's see here. Basically, what I, what I want to do is that once a branch target has been resolved, that it patches itself. So, like, once it has found a, a way to resolve a branch target, that it replaces itself, replaces these instructions with just a uh, jump direct. Um, that way we're not doing a... That way we're not doing an indirect branch every time we actually do a conditional branch, which is pretty frequently. So, I don't know. I think this would be pretty good. Um, the main thing that this would get us over our current implementation is we wouldn't be hitting memory twice every time we access a register. We're already fuzzing compiled or optimized code, so it's unlikely that that code is... Um, it's unlikely that the code's just not going to work out of the box. So, in our case, we end up basically reading and writing registers a lot. We end up issuing a lot of extra instructions and filling up the uh, pipeline and filling up the instruction queues and instruction caches with a bunch of code that will never actually be used. For example, the code that we would emit for something like this would be pretty horrendous. It would be like DRF RSI, add one to racks, store racks in RSI, DRF RF RSI, add or subtract five from racks, store RSI. Um, then we would do a DRF RSI, move immediate into a register, compare register, um, and then I forget how we do conditional branches. Um, I think we fall through to the next instruction on conditional branches. So I think conditional branches would look more like this. Um, at the end, 
this would then go to the next chain. Well, eventually it would get to a an indirect branch. Eventually this forcibly becomes an indirect branch. Where this, and let's see, if I do 19,000, 19,000, look at that. If they're both branching to the same location, it gets optimized out where we only have one. Which is pretty fucking nice. Um, so let's say this is 1905. It emits two separate things, and then we would continue on. So racks is greater than that, so we'll do racks times equals 32, right? And we can just go on and do shit like this. And it will emit, in this case, it will promote that to a shift, right? And those are the sorts of things that I'm not going to be able to do without a relatively complex um, optimization pass. And I think this is good. I could literally take this code as is and drop it into, um, drop it into my JIT and just run it. All I have to do is I just jump into it and I have a calling convention. I have to pass in another thing, which is like the return register. And I can just create this code. This has to be rep or C, of course. Because it has to be a known shape for the registers. But like... And this has to be extern C. But other than that, I just have to know the calling convention. And I just pass it in. And I should be able to be a little bit more strict. So I should be able to say... um see targets uh what is it is it just targets windows pc uh msvc x86 64 pc windows msvc xmc isn't compatible with naked i'm pretty sure it is Um, target. Okay, so then we would need this target installed. But then we can do rust up, target add. Right, I'm just trying to make sure that we can get a compatible uh, build. Oh, that's, yeah. So, we should be able to make an elf on Linux. Um... Or on Windows. That would be one thing, is I would want to make sure that I can build this in a way that I can use it on on uh, Windows. But I don't really care right now. I know that I could make it work, because all of these things I can get from... Um, I can get all of those from... Yeah, I, I should be able to get all these utilities from something in, like, Sigwin or something. So there's a way that I can make this build. So, I think everything here is good to go. Basically, everything gets a lot cheaper for, hmm, how hard would it be for me to lift functions? Basically, what I could do is when I see a conditional branch, I could just start lifting what that does. Right, so let's say this other path does this, and basically I, I lift recursively, and I keep making these indentations. This would be maximum performance. Basically try to lift the entire function. Um, and basically I would terminate all edges. Oh, what was the issue with this? Uh, loops. The issue with this, with this is loops. Um... How do I handle loops? Um, if a loop occurs, basically I need to make sure that I don't re relift that code. Um. Hmm. I basically need jumps and rust.
So if I wanted to lift something that had a loop, um, here's a conditional, and let's say this conditional is what returns it back to here, right? So this is like start loop. So this is the start loop, and then here we jump to this. Now if we literally do this jump to right now, and basically disassemble the fall through case, and then all other cases emit a jump, which would cause a new thing to get lifted, it would be pretty acceptable as is. But if I could actually get the loop to happen inside of Rust, that would be huge. Um, and I think I can do it with loop labels, where basically... Okay. Dude, this is nuts. This might be really good. Okay, so basically, I go through every instruction. So, and I'm just going to write it how I would have the code emit. So I'm going to do this, where I have, um, this is loop label, this is instruction 0000 loop. By default, every single instruction will get lifted into a loop. Um, you can't continue to a loop label that is below you, though. So I can't, I can't do like this, right? I wish I could, but that would be a go-to, and you can't do that. Um, so, actually, what happens there? I want, like, that could be an interesting edge case. Uh, continue inst, it just won't know that loop label. Yeah, undeclared label. Okay, so what I could do is every single instruction starts a new loop label, right? And in my code that's generating this, when I am generating loop labels, I am tracking which instructions I have already lifted. So every time I lift an instruction, I log, hey, just like in, I'm reading through these instructions and I lift the instruction. So let's go through and make a, a pseudo case. Add racks one, sub racks five, right? And let's say this is at zero, 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 zero. This is huge. This is really cool, I think. There's nothing here that wouldn't work. Um, then I lift that instruction, and I will do regs.racks minus equals 5, right? Subtract 5 from racks. Then, and we, and we got some loops. Now, we're just going to have this get really deep really fast. But eventually, uh, and then let's say, oh, eight is a compare racks with five. So this is inst eight. And remember, we're keeping track of these just in like a hash set of like when we're lifting a function or lifting this block or whatever we consider this thing to be, we will keep track of what we lifted already. And if we jump to something that we already lifted, then instead of issuing a jump to, we issue a continue to the instruction. <laughs> I think this works. So compare x with 5, and then we'll have OOC. We'll have a jump. Um, and basically, I have to stack instructions like this, I think. If Rust had go-tos, it'd be a lot easier, but I'm abusing loop labels in a really fucking weird way. Uh, so let's say this jump not equal to... Uh, actually, let's say this is um, a different architecture. So let's say branch if not equal to zero. Uh, racks five. Um... Yeah, branch if not equal to zero to uh, uh, this is going to, if it's not equal to zero, it will jump to here. I don't know why it's doing this logic, but let's just say it's doing this logic. If it's not equal to zero, then it jumps back to here. So it continues until it's zero. So then at the end, this is uh, the end case. So there's a loop that in our existing stuff would be an indirect jump every single time. And then we can say uh, branch if not equal to zero, 
And then the fall through case, this can just be an e-call or whatever. Or maybe this is ret. Right, let's say that's ret. So, for instruction 8, we will say if regs.racks is not equal to 0, then here we'd want to issue a jump to 0, 0, 0. So let's do that. It's not what we'll end up doing, but let's say this will jump to 0, 0, 0, 0. Then, in the fall through case here, um, we will start an inst OOC loop this, and this will then be, um, this is ret. So this will be like uh, uh, jump to regs dot ret, or like return address, jump table and regs. And let's say this is, we'll just give a ret u64. Okay. Jump to regs ra. Oh, yeah. Let's call it ra. The return address. Okay. And this is a u size, it doesn't really matter. Okay, unused labels, no big deal. We can just say, um,. Allow unused labels. Because the we're just going to generate this shit willy-nilly. And then we need colons on all these. I thought something looked a little naked about them. Okay. So now this is the code we emit. So here we do the add, a jump non-zero. Like, look at this shit. This is like a couple instructions that we would emit multiple loads and stores and register things. And this is just like, oh yeah, we can just subtract four from this. And then we can use the built-in flags in x86 to assert if it's zero or not. And then it's just, this is the code. Look how much it reduces down. Now, the downside is this will indirectly jump and then cause us to lift zero, 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 zero again, which already exists. So what we can do is anytime we emit a jump jump to if the value we are emitting is constant which is the case in all conditional branches because it's a fixed target for conditional branches for a fixed target conditional branch if we want to issue a jump to for something that is in the set of all of the instructions that we've lifted so far ah oh, fuck but we can't jump to something here like i couldn't jump to c i couldn't jump to something afterwards Damn it. I really wish Rust had, uh, but afterwards isn't on the stack. But, like, you could have, you could have something that jumps forward. It conditionally skips over some stuff and then rejoins. Why not just use if? The other thing is I could maybe do the shell code version of what I was talking about before, but I'm pretty sure um, function calls require... I'm pretty sure that function calls require that you um, flush all memory. I don't think there's a way that I can inline something and have the register structure still be active. But otherwise, I could abuse what I was doing before, and I could make a function for every instruction and then allow inlining to handle loops and all of that stuff. Um, but in this case, let's say regs racks is not equal to zero. I could do a continue inst... Oh, right. So in this case, if we're jumping to something that has already executed, we can do this. And in this situation, the jump non-zero will jump to back to three. Like, look at this fucking code. This would be so bad in our current setup. This is really cool. So this would work, but we can only continue back, right? And that logic is easy. We're lifting things. Every time we make a loop label or a stack, we could have a loop stack. Every time we're making that stack, we could just say, is this prior in the stack? If it is, 
uh, don't use a jump to, use a continue, and just give the label of that thing, and look at, look at that fucking code. Like, we get access to racks, we subtract four from it, and then we loop if it's not zero back to that. So we just loop forever if it's not zero, and then once it becomes zero, we fall through and we, uh, we store a zero into RSI because we know it's zero. That breaks the dependency on this. And then we do our uh, indirect jump. This is really good, and this would be very easy code to produce for an entire function, right? Like, this would be very easy code to generate for a function. Um, like, this is pretty fucking cool. <laughs> it's... Um... I don't know. This would be pretty pretty massive. And this would reduce the amount of lifting we do because we wouldn't go and relift things that we've already li If we ever lifted the instruction, we would just kind of keep that around, I guess. So, the other way that I could do this would be to make inline always on everything. And then this would be inst o and now we're back to what we were doing before, but we're doing it in a much more isolated scenario. Um, and I think in this case, it, I don't know, are we just back to the same problem? Like this works, but we can't jump to something after us. If you have a jump below, can you turn it into an if with the opposite condition? Uh, yeah, let's think about it. Let's think about it. I do think there is a way to express what I want to do. Um, and it doesn't matter how expensive it is at compile time. So let's imagine this would, if it's not equal to zero, then we would branch to 10. And 10 would do something else. It would move racks 17 uh, one, four, and then ret, right? So we do something, if it's not equal to zero, this is no longer a loop, this is just a conditional branch. Um, oh, actually, I don't think it matters. It, it, it's not possible to loop to anything you haven't executed. So this does work. You can't loop to anything you haven't already executed. If you're looping, you are jumping to something you already executed, and thus it's in your scope. If you're not looping, this is just a conditional. This is the exact same thing as what we were doing for ret, where this would end up being, if it's not equal to zero, then we emit a ret here, right? If it's not equal to zero, then we do this. Otherwise... Yeah, this is totally what we do. Now, it's harder to think about how we actually generate this, but once we get the pattern down, because I think this requires recursion. Um, oh, be right back.
Yeah, I was muted. Sorry. Um, I was saying that we've had the discussion of LVM IR many times before. It's a lot more work. It's a lot harder. It's harder to add things to. It's harder to understand what's actually happening. And it's a lot harder to get an environment where you can build it in a uh, compatible way. Because like Rust, you can just get on the command line or GCC or whatever, trivially. In fact, I could just use like C for this, honestly. C would probably be good because I have uh, loop la or labels. I don't know. See, I'd literally just omit all the instructions with a go-to label before them, and then I'd just have them jump to the go-to. The big reason for Rust is that it allows someone to modify the behavior of an instruction very quickly. Right? If I wanted to, like, add a breakpoint to this, I could just say, like, if in breakpoint table return breakpoint status right if this was lvm ir adding things like that would be a lot harder to do and a lot harder to understand but yeah c might make a lot more sense here it is the cross-platform assembler i could do it in rust now the question is does rust give me any perf gains does any of the uh, mutability stuff in Rust give me a perf gain here where it would be better? And I don't really think so. Rust is a little bit more cross-platform, which is nice. Because you need Rust to use my tool. <clears throat> um, and on Windows, you have kind of the MSVC compiler versus Clang. I mean, you can get Clang, but you kind of have to go out of your way to get it. Not that it matters too much. The other thing about Rust, which is cool, is I can make sure that my emulator is safe and can't corrupt the host memory. Which is actually really fucking cool. Can you... <sighs> hmm. Yeah, how do I generate this string? Decode instruction, make a label, tab in, <clears throat> omit payload of instruction, fall through to next instruction, omit payload of next instruction, fall through to next instruction, omit payload. This one's a special case because it's a conditional branch. Um, call recursively. Do a recursive call to the branch target and the false target, and then put them in an if statement. With the exception of if it's a jump to something that's in our stack. I think that works. I think that logic is that easy. I don't think it's actually that hard. Like... Literally, in a conditional branch, I'll just call, like, generate asm, or generate rust... And then inline that string in the true and false paths. There are cases where this doesn't work. Which ones? <clears throat> I'm curious to see the example. I don't see where this could fail.
I don't know. I don't think it's possible. I think all loops are handled by the continue. And the if statements are just if statements. I don't know where this could fail. I'm eating right now. That's why I'm a little distracted. Um... Not all CFGs can be represented as loops, as you wrote. I think they can. I might end up lifting duplicate code. I might end up emitting the same thing multiple times in multiple places. But I don't think there's any situation where this isn't true. The loop labels cover all possible loops. And <clears throat> anything else is just covered by if statements, because that's all they are. Like, I feel pretty confident that there are no edge cases here. Yeah, re I really don't think it's possible. <clears throat> How about this? All right. Ah. Okay. So this would this would be a branch where one of them includes this code. And the other one, or one of them includes this code on the taken path, and the other one includes this path. And then branch not equal B, this one is um, this one is not, let's see, that would branch there, that would branch here, this jumps to B which would be in an if statement because it's not a loop. It could be a loop in some situations, but I think we can represent this. Jump A, branch not equal to C. Branch not equal to C, okay. So you have two different paths to get there. So this instruction is the only thing in the stack so at this location, you can only jump back to A if, if, yeah, I think it's fine. There's duplicate code, and, and that's what I'm saying. But, so if you go from here, and you take the fall-through path, and you go to here, then B is a loop, and you jump back to it. <clears throat> and if you take this path to C then you're not technically in a loop when you jump to B. Because B is not a, a location that you've visited yet in your chain. B is a new unique target to you. It's not a loop. It becomes a loop if you hit B again and you come back. Then I can construct programs that will take two to the end to represent. But is that really a realistic case? Am I trying to protect myself from a malicious binary that's trying to fuck with my JIT? Or am I just lifting normal programs?
Actually, a hard problem that dive into graph theory. Can we agree that this would work trivially in, in C? Can we in, agree with that? That we can just use labels and go-tos. And we just, every time we lift something, okay, I agree. We only really access memory and memory loads and stores in C. So the amount of code that we have to get right is so small um, that I think C would be fine. Representing this as loops and rust is a hard problem. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm thinking about it because it's fun. Because it's a fun thought experiment. Not because it's the easiest or fastest path to success. It's just really interesting. Um... My goal is that my C and my Rust will have the same output. I won't use Rust until I can find a way that has identical output. Now, I believe that, that the Rust code would optimize down because it would see the duplicate behavior, and it would optimize all that shit out, and it would end up being what the C code is, but it would be a lot more work. <laughs> um... I don't know how common this pattern is in programming. Uh, I feel like it's probably relatively rare to skip over a loop and then re-enter the loop. Because a compiler typically isn't going to have you bypass a loop just to re-enter a loop. I think it's quite common. Maybe on a larger graph scale. Yeah, I could maybe see that. I think it's a fun fucking problem. I mean, yeah, we can do C. <laughs> we can use Clang. Um, the other thing that's really cool about this, the only thing that makes this uh, tied to a specific OS would be the calling convention that is used to enter the JIT and the handwritten assembly that will be used to, um, to do uh, an indirect branch, to basically terminate a chain and do an indirect branch. Um, Let's see. Now, there is one big advantage to Rust that we haven't talked about. And that is a usable inline assembler and configuration system. And an easy cross-compiling thing, but that doesn't matter nearly as much. But it would actually be cool to make this JIT work on ARM and MIPS and whatever. Like, make this produce code in a way that, yeah, we might have to do, like, an if def x86, this, else, MIPS. But, like, this will be a relatively small amount of code. And then we'll have an entry point that will jump into the JIT by knowing the calling convention and, and jumping to this code. Um... But luckily, if we just use the C calling convention, I'm pretty sure we can do that without assembly. Uh, if we want to clobber the stack, which is kind of my plan, I think we will have to do that. So, even if that's just a small assembly block that writes over SP. But yeah, I do think we're going to clobber the stack. Um, see you later, Browse Man. Will it be something like the Move Fuscator? Not this. Kind of similar where we're doing binary transforms, but n not quite the same. We're not trying to obfuscate. I don't know, Desu. What are your thoughts on this, of, uh, of using C for this? Pretty much the only way. 
I do think it's a lot easier to find a C compiler than to get an LLVM IR environment working. And I think it's a lot easier to hack on and patch. And I think it's a lot easier for people to understand the ramifications of what they're doing. Like, imagine someone comes along and wants to use this tool and they want to change the behavior of compare to do four byte level compares so they can get coverage events on those things. That is going to suck in LLVM. But if you do it in C, you can just change the implementation. You can change the template that we use when we emit a compare instruction. And you just change the C code for it. In the ideal world, I'd use the proper IR. Probably LLVM or crane lift, yeah. I mean, I use IRs in my other stuff. My vectorized emulation stuff, I have an IR, and I do optimization passes. Um, but this is meant to be approachable. I am trying to make the fastest possible JIT that you can still play with and modify and improve or augment while knowing C or better. Not expecting you to fluently know assembly where you can tweak inline things or no LLVM IR. For my own shit, I'm just going to do my own IR. <laughs> and that's what I've been doing. Um, but that's not something that I want other people to deal with because it's fucking hard. <laughs> like, everything becomes a very hard problem very fast with an IR. You, you have to be pretty comfortable with graph theory. You have to be pretty comfortable with just writing assembly, which I am. But, like, when people say they know assembly, they typically mean they can read it or they can debug something by looking at assembly. There's a big difference between reading assembly and fluently and productively writing things in assembly in a way that you can hook and modify the other thing is in Rust, we don't have to worry about kind of the layout of things in memory. Rust can kind of handle that for us, whereas with LLVM, I'm not sure. I think we have to do a little bit more manual data manipulation, which actually kind of helps us because it means we're not so sketchy. I don't know if you saw what we were doing, Desu, but we build, we build an object file, and then we strip the text section out of the object file, and then we link it. And basically, if it depends on anything that is not in the text section, this would then fail to link. So this basically filters to make sure that there is nothing in the code that relies on any data, even if it's relative. Even if it's a relative offset, it's not allowed, unless it's in the text section. You could have a reference to your own text section. But this basically guarantees that the code is 100% portable, which means uh, in terms of like uh, its pick. So we could put it anywhere in memory, and we don't have to move it with the data section, and we can use a JIT where we literally just append blocks to each other. Because in a JIT, we can't have, yeah, LLVM sometimes emits jump tables. Um, hopefully it won't in this case. I think jump tables will only be used for indirect branches, and indirect branches won't exist. We'll never emit an indirect branch. Or a switch statement. I don't think we'd ever have that. And that's why we have this assertion. I'm pretty sure that scenario would never really come up. Um, well, actually, yeah, I don't think it would ever come up. Because I'm not aware of any architecture that has ternary conditional branches where there are multiple targets that isn't an indirect branch. And if we're lifting an indirect branch, we're not emitting code. We're emitting the like little jump stub, the little like jump to the next JIT block or exit if it's not valid. Um, and that means everything will be an if statement. There will never be a situation that would come up I think. Yeah. It could do some crazy optimization pass where, like, maybe we lift unoptimized code. Like, we're fuzzing an unoptimized RISC-V binary. And, like, a bunch of the conditions it checks 
are overlapping conditions, and it's better to emit code that just, instead of doing a bunch of nested ifs, does, like, a decision jump table or something. I'd imagine we can turn that off. I'd imagine there has to be a flag to turn that off, because that sounds like something that you might not want in certain targets. But, anyways, I think jump tables only are used for, like, decisions of 8 or greater. Like, I typically see in a called graph, I see, like, this, the, like, split blocks of a decision tree. Usually pretty deep. It seems like compilers are not terribly willing to do jump tables until it's a pretty big, uh, um, a disjoint set of, of, possibilities what distro are you using i'm using debian here so yeah i think we'll change this to be c because then we can just use labels and then we can just jump um and then we can just do like inst oh right and we can do, uh, this will take in a, we'll have a struct registers, uh, unsigned long u uh, racks, and we'll pull in uh, um, standard int.h, because we'll use the 64s and stuff. If we could make this relatively architecture agnostic, except for maybe the entry and exit trampolines of the, the JIT itself, that would be really fucking neat. Uh, so if we do things like uint64, we can make sure that this could build theoretically on 32-bit, and you could run this JIT on a 32-bit system. Okay. Um, so we'll do... Uh, this will take... Uh... Uh, inst o, and then so we'll do clang o test dot o c test dot c. Okay, nice. Oh, yep, semicolon after structures. It's been a while since I've done C, so you get to watch me struggle for a bit. Um, struct registers regs. Uh, regs, racks, plus equals one. Let's try this, or plus equals five. Doesn't matter. Okay, so that's working, and then how do I make this a naked function and void? Um, how do I make a uh, claim naked function? Attribute naked, this. Oh yeah, and then let's optimize it. Dash O three. Okay, I guess we don't have to use naked until we see the emission of uh, VSP test RS until we see uh, stack usages occurring. So. We'll implement this, add racks one, sub racks five, uh, inst 008, if regs racks is not equal to zero, go to inst 000, or 010, inst 010, um, Oh, and then there's a ret here. This is inst OOC, and then this will call the like uh, jump out. And then here we will have the uh, regs racks is 17, and then jump out. Okay, so then void jump out.
Keystone is an assembler, if I'm not mistaken. Keystone is, is for assembling. And we want the optimizations that we get from a higher level language or an IR, but we're not using an IR in this case. We already have something that generates assembly and it's uh, very slow and that's what we're trying to uh, move away from right now. Um, clang attribute no return. And let's see if we can get some wall going. Let's get some let's get some loudness. Unused label. Okay. Um W no unused label. Um what? Oh no hyphen. Okay. Make um now we're going to um we want this jump out, so this will have a uint pointer t, or more specifically, a void star to the jump table, and then we'll have the registers, and then we want to say no return on these, and hopefully, I'm hoping that, um... What's the best way to do it? Under no return? I kind of hope this yells at me. Yes, nice. That's what I wanted. I wanted it to prove to me that I handled all exit paths. And in this case, I should have now. Um, now 13 is unhappy. So then... Uh, inline asm lvm intel i haven't done an assembly with intel syntax or uh, i haven't done assembly for just a long time in general when compiling this i get an error um comp translating those okay all right we're making progress i think I think this is the same syntax as Rust, actually. Um, inline as in no return. How do I do no return inline assembly? And why is there no manual on inline assembly? Um, module level, no. Oh, that's IR. Um, assembly. Okay, okay. Ah, oh, fuck, that's LVM. Constraints? Modifiers? Yep. So these are for the constraints for... Yeah. Um, These are good, though. We want to keep this tab open for sure. Um... Converting my MP4 metadata parser to Rust as my first actual Rust program. Congratulations. Hope you're having fun with that. It's fucking sweet. Um, my foo. Go to labels, clobbers, qualifiers, inline. May perform a jump to one of the labels of go-to labels. Yeah, how do I send no return? Actually. Um.
the fuck? CC. Um. Huh. Oops. Inline assembly, no return. Ooh. 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 Oh, that's rust. Shit. Um. What if I do it on this? Nope. Uh, force. Look at the implementation definition of long jump. Yeah, uh, clang. I mean, to be honest, I don't think that's really going to hurt me. I forget how I do multi-line strings in C. I can't remember if I can or not. I think I have to do a quote on every line. Do I have to put a semicolon on every line too? Yeah, okay. Well, there's my ebb fee. It's not a big deal because we'll never execute it, right? C++11 has multi-line strings? Thank you. Are we technically C++ developers today? What the fuck is this? I see. Um, R delimiter curly. It's gnarly. Um, test dot. Yeah, it's round. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, CPP. Some of the first C++ I've written in about a decade. Oh. Oh, capital R? Does it have to be capital? Ooh, look at that! Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Goodster. Holy shit, is this language usable now? Oh, even my syntax highlighting is happy about it? Oh, yes! And I'm assuming it behaves the same as Rust, where I, I can, uh, I don't need shit between all the lines. Do I need semicolons after every line? You piece of shit. Wait. The fuck? Does it just not work? Okay. Am I forced to have something on every line? Is it the new line that throws it off? Or it can't handle the new line? 
Oh, what a piece of shit. Oh, remove the inner quotes? Yeah, why do I have inner quotes there? Thank you. <gasps> it's a usable language. Oh my god. Thank you for that. Um. Wow! Wow! Uh, so will this flush out registers when we jump to this now? Okay, jump, table, and regs. Um, that writes out the 11, then it goes there. That's just a knob. And then it loops forever. So. Um, is it guaranteed that these will get emit in the order that they are declared in the file? I think the answer is yes. Um, can I mark this inline only? That should prevent it from being emit, and then, oh, I forgot. It's a fucking language where you have to say everything before you do it. Okay. Subtract four. Then, if it is zero, jump to 12. And 12 is an int three. If it's not equal to zero, we go, if it is zero, then we go here where, yeah, that's true. Yeah, in three right away. Otherwise, we fall through and we store 17 into the register and then we int three. That's clean as fuck. One, two, like that's code. This is just doesn't matter. That's pretty fucking clean. That's pretty damn clean. Uh, add quad word uses a byte immediate so it saves space. Um, and it, it sign extends that byte. Jump zero. Move. Is it a D word immediate? Because it has to be for this instruction. And then there's our int three. And then that code. Oh, we can mark this as uh, static. Right. So now we're saying don't omit that code. So always inline that and make that static so it's not accessible outside. And then this is all the text that gets omit. Add this. There's our int three. Um, there's got to be a way that I can say no return. Um, playing no return. Um... How do I pr how do I just prove that abort Is there a way Is there a way to say no return You said to look at long jump Where could I find this code? It's marked no return. It's dank. I'd have to find code for that. Built in unreachable? That sounds pretty good to me. 
Thank you. It's undefined. Um, yeah, after inline assembly. That's their example. Yes! Thank you so much, uh, 1F9F1. Fuck yeah, dude. Much better. Yes! Look at that code! Fuck yeah, dude. This is so good. Dude, look how clean that is! Holy shit! Like, do you know how much work it would take to generate this assembly? When I have, like, const prop that needs to happen here, I have, um, promotion of a byte here so I can use a smaller size, uh, awareness of x86 flags so I prevent, uh, I prevent myself from actually doing a, um, a compare here. I just avoid the compare entirely, even though I'm doing a compare. Like, my stuff would currently emit a compare. Um, and then, I mean, that's pretty fucking clean. <laughs> Dude, that's so good. Like, I don't know, man. That is some good-looking fucking code. So, this is how we might be writing our JIT. <laughs> How fucking cool is that? Oh, you're trying to do the, the Rust JIT stuff? How's that treating you? I think this is going to be the way. This is going to be the way. Um, do I have to do two passes of the program? Or two passes of the function? I need to do one. I think I need to do one pass first that figures out what instructions are in here. Because I can't omit a go to ints 10 unless I know that that exists. Right? Oh, yeah. And we can do this. This is, what, this is how we'll generate code. We'll literally do this on every instruction. Right? Like, after we emit everything, we'll just go to the next one. And it, it won't matter because we won't use any of this stuff. And that one will fall. Um, okay, this is looking good. So basically, I think what I do is I go through and I queue instructions. I think this is how I handle it. I decode an instruction, I then queue the next instruction, and I issue a go-to to it. And then I decode the next instruction or I I init I start a queue. I populate the queue. I populate a queue initially with the because I want to process it mainly in order because I don't know how well this will optimize if it's jumping literally all over the place. But um Let's see here. I'm pretty sure if I emit this code. Always oh, inline doesn't guarantee it will inline it. I don't really care, right? I'm I'm very happy with, with using this hint. Um if it uses the stack, we'll 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 catch it. Yeah, how do I actually prevent this from using the stack? I mean, I guess I don't care too much. 
as long as it uses it correctly. Oh, I cared about the stack before because I didn't want frames, and now I don't really care about the frames because um, we're going to be doing so much in intra function that if we're actually allocating frames now, I don't care anymore. So before I cared about it not using the stack because I thought we were going to lift blocks, but now that we're lifting entire functions, I don't actually care anymore. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't care enough if it starts allocating shit on the stack. As long as I can jump into it, and as long as it cleans up the stack when it's done, when it goes to a jump out, which I'm not sure if it will. I think that was the problem in Clang. I think in Clang we had the problem of... Or in Rust we had the problem where... Um... Some of these stack variables weren't getting popped off when we jumped to jump out. Okay. That makes sense. So there's no state being updated. Um. Uh, we'll just mark this volatile. Even though it's on a stack. I don't know if volatile will override that it's stack. Uh, requires mem set, but it's not present. Yeah, that's fine. Don't initialize it. Okay. So then here we move byte rsp minus one. Fucking red zones. Fucking red zones. Wait, what? Wait. How does that work? It optimizes it out so it's just one byte on the stack, but it's not in the correct location. I'll we'll do this. What? What the fuck? I guess it can just prove that no one's using them. Um. Oh, what? So in Rust, we had a problem where it wasn't cleaning up the stack when it jumped to a no return. And we want to make sure it cleans up its stack. Um, if we're lifting enough, we could actually have these return. Like, we could potentially make these... Instead of jump out, they could return, and they return the address of where they want to execute. And then I just have a loop where every time it returns, I check the return code. So, like, I would have, like, an engine, right? And this is just looping. And we basically uh, call JIT, and then the JIT returns, and it returns the return address. And we either uh, jump to the next thing. Well, we want the JIT to be able to chain. Well, I guess it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter if the JIT chains or if it returns back. And if it returns back, then we can just... Um, if it returns back, then we can get the like next uh, target is equal to this. So we like... We call the JIT. So the first thing we do is like resolve JIT for PC. And then we call JIT. The JIT will return next target, but it might optionally return an error and say, like, hey, I access something, I'm fucked, break out of the loop. So then I can have this engine around this that will invoke the JIT, and then once it is done, it will then resolve next target, and then uh, loop uh, back. And I probably can do this in Rust. I can probably do this in Rust. 
which means that I won't need any assembly. So I can get rid of my assembly. It means I will have to return on like every function, kind of, I'll return, but it shouldn't be that big of a deal. And it means that I will no longer have any assembly in this entire chain. I'll no longer have any assembly at all. Uh, and instead, there'll be like an outside executor that will be waiting for um, unit64t, and then this will be saying, when it's done, and that way we only have one function, and this will just say like return, um, and this will basically say, I, hey, I would like to execute this address. And then this would say, I want to execute this address. And it's probably like regs.ret or whatever. And then I don't care if it uses stack. I don't care how it organizes things in memory. As long as it doesn't use data, a data section, it's fine. So then this will be... And I think this will make it easier for it to reason about conditionals. Like in this case, it can do a conditional move now because it doesn't have that jump out. I think this is going to be uh, much nicer to the compiler. So yeah, I think we just, we lift an instruction, we dump the inst label, we implement what the instruction does, we implement a go-to to the next instruction, um, and optionally we'll return out if it's an indirect branch. Only indirect branches will be return points or exceptions. Um, can I return tuples? I don't know if that's like a C++ thing. No, it definitely isn't. I think you can return structures, but you can't you can't make a tuple on the fly. Um standard pair. Is that compatible with um Is that compatible with uh, and standard tuple? How the fuck do I get standard? Angled brackets? Just this? No. Oh, oh, I see. I see. <laughs> Ooh, how do I get standard, though? Oh, God, what is happening to me? Okay, then how do I make a tuple? Okay, make tuple? Is this standard make tuple? I'm gonna guess it's standard make tuple. Come on. Oh, we did it! <laughs> we, we wrote C++! <laughs> Thanks, chat! Twitch writes C++. Okay, so then... Is... Is this tuple, um, is that repper C? If I call this from Rust, and this is repper C, and I have it returning a tuple, will that work? Or is this not a standard thing? Is this returning, it looks like it's returning an object. So is this going to be acceptable? I see an uh, so we're going to do this. We're just going to return. We're going to have an enum. Um, and it's going to be uh, exit codes. And we'll say... Um, uh, indirect branch is zero. And then here we'll say, uh, UN64T 
uh, 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 exit code. Mm hmm. Right. You pick, you're picking up what I'm putting down. Um, and then this is the target, right? Okay. Interact branch. I'm fine with this because I want to return data like this anyways. What? What? Strawberry Hacker, thank you so much for the raid. Oh man, that strawberry looks delicious. I love that icon. I love food icons. Damn it. Um... You can pack it into a pod type? Okay, that sounds pretty interesting. Um, obj dump d test.o. What's this shit about? Inst registers. How did the debugger write and go? What are you writing? That sounds like a fun project. This is using... Jesus Christ. It's trying to do SSE instructions to populate that, and it's using a constant in memory. An ARM debugger for my new 8-core Cortex A53 board. Oh, that sounds super fun. Like, um... Is this, like, a hardware-level, like, uh, JTAG debugger? Or a software-level debugger? That sounds pretty fucking fun. Shit, how do I get this... So this is... I could tell this to not use SSE, but I don't want to do that. Uh, plus 38. That plus 38. Huh. Um. I mean, okay, so... What if I didn't strip it? This is going to add a bunch of padding, and then here are the constants. That might be the code first. Yeah, so this is like some data section shit. Um... Uh, strip. I can object copy and strip it. And I think that removes sections too, right? Uh, can I strip it that hard? Strip all. Remove all symbol and relocation information. Remove section. I want it to clean up sections. Um. I feel like there's got to be a way to remove sections. Right? Okay. 
compress, there's a way to compress debug sections. P. Um, there's got to be a way, right? Let's just do cap S, see what happens. I want my text section to be first. So, so one option is I can remove the padding, uh, the section padding, and I can just allow the compiler to go ham and use constants if it wants, and then I just include that in my JIT. Basically, I would set, set like a 16-byte section align, and if I have a 16-byte section align, I can just include the entire object copied thing into into my uh, into my program. So, I'm pretty sure I could have this um, linker. Uh, uh, help grep um, align, section alignment, and file alignment. Okay. So we will do set linker flag section alignment to 16, WL uh, program alignment is 16, or file alignment, sorry, section alignment and program alignment. Um, Is that not the correct way to pass a linker flag? Linker input unused. Oh, because I'm not linking. Whoops, here we're linking. Section alignment 16, file alignment 16. I think file alignment is relatively new. Whoa. What? I mean, this looks fun. Page line sections, and then this is set the text and data sections to be readable and writable. Mm, we'll just do, do not page line sections link against li aesthetic libraries. That looks fun. Okay, this is looking better. Now, how do I ensure the text section comes before without a linker script? I know I could do it with a linker script, but end magic, now we don't have any of this alignment shit, and now I think things will be aligned I want the text to be first pretty bad. Um, linker put text first. Oh, is that 7F elf in there? No. The elf header's not in here. Okay. Yeah, that's for a linker script. And I could I could make a linker script, but I don't like it because it's they, they are annoying. Um, otherwise I have to know the offset of the, yeah, I think we'll do, uh, linker script LD. Come on. Simple example. Perfect. This is what I want. LD script dot LD. You can make a function, a separate elf section, and then specify that section to be the. F how do I, how do I specify the first section? I guess. 
Because, like, I can, yeah, I can do it with a linker script, but is there a better way? Set first section linker. Section pl placement with the first and last attributes. Okay, that sounds dank. And this is uh, first section? Okay. Oh, sort section. Section start. Specifies section sorting rule when linker script is used. Section start. Um. Name of the entry point symbol. Hey, that's good. We want that one. Garbage collect sections, and then here I can do um, strip test.o. Oh shit. Wow, which one did that? Was that GC sections or strip? GC sections. Holy shit. That's big. Um And then what if I don't strip? Does it matter? Probably not. I don't think strip is needed. That's pretty fucking good. Um, and then we'll do a read elf. L on test. And this will show the layout. Wait, where's that text section at? GC sections. Is it because we didn't specify an entry point? So it's GCing text. So we can just mark this as start. Is that still not finding start? Um. No underscore? What? Huh. Can't find, yep, mm-hmm. I think it's just dash entry. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Huh? Um... The fuck? Test on O. I 
I don't need to mark it X turn because it's C, right? Or C plus plus. Oh, do I have to do X turn C? Okay. So now it's no longer complaining. Nice. Okay. And we can just say start. And then this will now complain again. Yep. I forgot we're doing C. You should shift the immediate right by 12 bits on this line. Is it wrong? Is it wrong, or does it just make it more convenient to use later? Load upper immediate. And add upper immediate PC. Is only those two? Um, I, don't think, I don't think that one is a bug. Right, so we have this. We're not shifting it into place, but if we look at uh, risk v spec, yep, this. Come on. Wow, something is struggling on the website. Um, GitHub latest spec save. This time we'll open it. And we'll bookmark this one, and then risk v will unbookmark this one. Okay. So, are we PC? So it takes an immediate. You used to build 32-bit constants, and is the U-type here. Yeah, and that's what we do, isn't it? Yeah, that's what we do already. Um... Do, do, do. Shift it to the right by 12. Yeah, because it's supposed to be in these bits. There's like no way my code would even remotely work without that because this is used to access basically all globals, these two functions, or two instructions, right? It, the immediate is supposed to be bits 31 to 12. Um, okay, so... We want to put text first. Oh yeah, um, object dump does it displays it in a confusing way. Yeah, that got me the other day too. They display the actual immediate. Um. So am I gonna have to use a linker script here? Wait, what? What was my current problem? Um. We set the entry point. Oh, GC sections was killing us. So we want to see if GC sections now is killing us because now we define an entry point. And I'm guessing GC sections was only a problem. Yeah, it was a problem because there was no entry point. So GC sections now works again. And there's an exception handling frame, which maybe we can get rid of. Strip everything. Okay, that was a bit aggro for stripping. Um, uh, oh, yeah, we were going to see if LD, LD10 help Vim dash. 
GC, don't align them. Um, section start, set address of section. Do I do text dash start? Compile with no accept? How, how do I do that? Um, but yes, I do want that. Is that a flag? Because I would like that very much. Dash F no exceptions. Sweet. There's still an F frame. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like there are many good, uh, solutions to this. Backtrace, those, okay. No asynchronous unwind tables. That's, that's the one I was looking for. Duh. Hey, we did it. <laughs> Dank. Honestly, that's a massive code reduction. Uh, no asynchronous unwind tables. No unused label, that's just getting rid of the warning. Uh, GC sections, and magic means we put them just back to back, and we just fucking stuff them next to each other. Um, virtual address, mem size. Yeah, this is the linked version. What was the size before? It was pretty large. It, it was like... Three times larger than this. Um, 98 hex bytes, technically 99, down to 58 hex bytes, 59. So, a reduction of 30 hex, uh, 40 hex, sorry, uh, which is 64, 64 byte reduction. Yeah. Super nice, especially because we're going to generate this for a shit ton of functions, and then we're going to append all of the sections together. Um, my make fell as large as hell to get most of the garbage out. Yeah, this is looking good. RO data and text. And then if I make, if I make a linker script... If I make this linker script and I say RO data next, will it complain if I don't specify the section? Uh, if I if I have a data section show up and I don't specify it, I want it to yell at me so it's like, yo, I don't know what to do with this section. How much L3 your cache has in total? It's like 50 megs or something ridiculous. <laughs> um, uh, script. Dash T. Hey, there we go. We got the text first now. And, oh, does that just put them right next to each other? Do I need end magic anymore? Or GC sections, to be honest? Make. No, because now my linker script is explicitly 
saying how to handle this. And I'm guessing they'll get aligned correctly. It's not going to start the data section unaligned, right? It wouldn't do that. That would be stupid. Um, yeah, it looks like this data starts at 50, and I bet this is accessing 50. Yeah, it still honors the alignment of the variables. So I shouldn't have to worry about that because this is going to do, um, this is an aligned 128-bit load, and it, it correctly is aligned here. So I don't think I need to worry about that. So LD script there. And then if I don't specify RO data, it just puts it wherever. Fuck. Um, is there a way that I could have LD script get mad at me? Um... You can have comments, sections, this, discarding. The linker will not normally create output sections with no contents, blah, blah, blah. If there's a foo section, okay. Um, oh, you can just put random ints. Dank. Um. Okay. I really want this to yell at me because I want it to fail closed if a new section gets emit. I want to make sure... That there's no way for that to get in front of me. Um, that's overlay. Input section. Garbage collection. Okay. Um, matches any number of characters. So star data. Yeah, I actually have no idea what all the wildcards and shit mean in a linker script. So this is saying the text section, or is that saying anything that is the text section? What what does that mean? Oh, file name. So the file name dot text. And then I see. Yep. So that's saying all files. Interesting. I'm learning how linker scripts work. Um A through Z data, data, okay. In order of which they're seen during the link. Um, okay, matches any file name. include more than one section is the order of them they will be intermingled appearing in the same order they're found in link linker input the second all text input sections will appear first followed by all our data is there no way for me to like fail closed on on this shit like can I not 
Maybe I can do this. Or at least it puts it after text. Nope. No undefined version. Reports version scripts that refer undefined symbols. Never use it, seems relevant. Try it. We'll YOLO. We'll fuck it. We'll do it live. Um. Nope. Don't give a shit. Damn it. Um. You can use file names with common section. Damn. Is there no way to do this? It's kind of ridiculous to me. Like, does no one care? Does no one care about, like, a new section showing up and they just literally have no idea what the fuck's going on? Is that, is that not a thing that people care about? It's ridiculous. What the fuck? Oh my god, that is ridiculous. Input section flags. Yeah, but that's not gonna do the trick. Dude, that makes no sense to me. Um, dude, seriously, no one care. Address type. That's for overlays. Don't care about. Um, holy shit. Seriously? Linker script, um, warn sections. I don't fucking know. They need to be explicitly placed. Orphan handling? I'm having like deja vu here. I don't remember if I saw this or not. Come on. Control how orphan sections are handled when linker script is used. Okay. Help. Okay, so there's warn. Ah, look at this. Holy shit, can we make this strict? Okay. 
Let's GC first. Okay. Mm. That's being placed in RO data. The fuck? Why would it tell me about sections it's going to remove? Which are present in info files and not explicitly placed into it by it. Yep. We'll still copy this, but either finding, creating, blah, blah, blah. Be placed at the end. If there's no section, okay. Place, discard, and error. Creates a separate output section for every input section matching section. Well, I like that. I like this, but do I really have to place all of these? Um... Okay. Dot star. Star dot star. Can I do that? Probably not. Oh, colon. Section type mismatch. I'm kind of surprised that this yells at me so much. So which one do I have to do? I think I have to place these. File. Dot that. Is being placed. So these get placed in some sections. So they make a new section with a name. Linger scripts aren't known for their error handling. Usually they're at my own script to check. This seems good. This orphan handling seems good. The problem is it seems a bit a little bit verbose, you know? You need it you need to have a space there. Classy. RO data star. There's common. Okay, here's everything else. I just want these to get cleaned up. God damn it. How do I... I kind of want to like link it and then link it again, <laughs> but I don't think there's a way to do that. Um, that is being placed in comment. And then how do I have these internal, um, Okay, uh, GC object file sections. Maybe there's a way that I can do it. Um. Nope.
I mean, we can just put the RO data in there, but I'm just so scared if data ends up in there that we're just not going to know that it's there. And we're just going to be fucked. Um... What are these sorts? Sort the input sections by name first. Sort the files for sections. Actually, what's the default linker script? 